Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. I don't know. Part of me thinks the kid's right. He asked what he's done to deserve this. He wants to stay here. Fine. Let's leave him go home, you know? But then spend another part of me thinks, what if by some miracle we stay and actually make it out of here? Someday we might look back on this and decide that podcasting Private Ryan was the one decent thing we were able to pull out of this whole goddamn shitty mess. Like you said, Captain, maybe we do that. Maybe we are in the right to go podcast. <laughs> So podcast is home and saving in, in this? Okay. Okay. Great. My brain's broken. Hi, everybody. My name is Griffin Newman. David Sims. This is a podcast that's called Blank Check with Griffin and David. That's right. We do miniseries. We like focusing on directors, filmographies, people who have seismic success early on in their career and then get a series of blank checks for the rest of their life to make whatever. For the rest of their natural life. To some degree or another. Sure. Maybe the check, the amount changes mm -hmm. but they keep on dining out on that on that success that mm -hmm. early success sometimes the checks clear sometimes they bounce baby mm -hmm. uh this is a series about the most successful filmmaker of all time with the biggest blank check of all time that's our idea it's called pod me if you cast what do you think of that richard um i think it's good Thank i think you. you had so many options to go with that but i think that was the right one <laughs> honestly we didn't have that many options. yeah we went through literally <laughs> all of them a lot of movies but not not a lot of uh, room to play around i was pushing yeah. for the pod ventures of cast cast you should have pushed harder. <laughs> I gotta say, that's the lesson for this new year: push. Well, that's a, sometimes delivering a baby isn't comfortable, but you got to put a, exactly a, something right. important into the world. That's something you know a lot about. It's something I know a lot about. All right, so, and today yeah. we're talking about something else I know a lot about: war, <laughs> the D-Day landing. Yeah, uh, this is our episode on Saint Pratt Ryan. Uh, this is uh, the uh, third film in our mini series that tracks uh, Spielberg. The DreamWorks here, when he founded his own movie studio and could make whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lost World, we're, we're kind of flubbing, wasn't really DreamWorks. Amistad was the first big attempt, and it belly flopped. And then this was him doing, I think, what DreamWorks was founded on, the idea of him being able to deliver something like this. Sure. You know? An yeah. Oscar favorite, the right. number one highest grossing film of 1998. It was, yeah. And, and uh, a modern American classic by, by most metrics. So. People, I think, view it that way. Yeah. I don't know. We'll discuss. Anyway, we have a guest. Introduce We have guest. a guest here today. He's a favorite he's of the show. Silently. And he's a favorite of ours. You know him from Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. You know him from Little Gold Man Podcast. Yeah. You know him from. It's been good this year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our episodes on Lady in the Water. True. And Vanilla Sky. Yeah, you've been yeah. going up in quality from like a stinker yep. to flawed but interesting. And now here you are at Saving Private Well, Ryan. I wanted to do the episode about the terminal, but I, since I wrote the movie, I felt like. <laughs> I mean, you I could have offered some, it the whole some time. good inside baseball, but yeah. Richard Lawson, ladies and gentlemen. Also, David, I resent. I would rank those three movies as Lady in the Water 1, Vanilla Sky 2, Saving Private Ryan 3. Whoa. Great. Uh, Richard. Yeah. Uh, I, wa I want to get straight to this. I want to dig in because. You, um, you're a favorite guest of the show. Well, thank you. I'm one of our favorite people, and, uh, you know, we didn't have you on the last miniseries, and I threw nope. to you, I said, we're doing Spielberg, is there anyone that jumps out to you that you'd want to do? And you said, well, I think I'd have a lot to say about Saving Private Ryan, mm -hmm. because that movie made me almost join the military. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, twist. I know this isn't a Shyamalan series, but I'm going to throw a twist out. Okay. Richard knows this. You don't. Okay. I had never seen this movie before last night. What? Yeah. I that's insane know that. to me. That I guess crazy. you are younger, but like, yeah, that's, but, but like, so, never. It was like it. your patriotic duty to see that movie. Okay, it, you know, it's true. It was. Now you must have been about yeah nine when it came out. That was not when it came out. Yeah, so you know, but I saw something about Mary then. like three times in theaters. I mean, it wasn't like you know <sighs> what I'm boy. saying. You, yeah, I do know what you're saying. I mean, uh, you were a gross little boy. That's yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> I was a little stinker. <laughs> you still are. <laughs> but um uh, well, well, we'll unpack all of that later. But I just uh want to set up the central question, which is, can you explain to me how uh, watching this movie made you want to join yeah, the military? Because I yeah. knew that about you, too, and I was also re-watching it, and I was like, wait a second. Yeah. Because, because watching this movie, I have never wanted to do anything less. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm more encouraged to become a camp counselor after watching Friday the 13th. Like, this movie 
Yeah, I. It's weird. I mean, it's the same kind of thing where after I saw Silence of the Lambs, I wanted to become an FBI agent, which is like that's that makes more sense to me. Though. I mean, it doesn't make a little more sense. Um, I she wins. Yeah. So I wa- I first saw <laughs> I mean, she, she wins. Does she? She she, she wins the murder. I mean, she learns that the the yeah. lambs never stop. She's screaming. traumatized for life. Right. But, yeah. um, she wins. <laughs> um, so I first saw this movie in the theater. I would think I was like fifteen because it came came out ninety eight. Ninety eight. Yes. Um, summer of. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, so was, uh, I so loved it, you know, me too. had never seen anything like it. We'll get into all that. But um, but then a couple of years later, I'm about to graduate from high school and um, I you're wondering what I, to do. With I bought school. it on VHS. Yeah. And I was a terrible student in high school and I kind of had a sort of in at my the college I ended up going to because mm-hmm. my dad taught there. But I was sort of like not I was I was feeling a need to do something that I really believed in. And sure. I was watching that movie a lot. Like I, I probably watched it three or four times in I don't know the span of a month or so. And just something about it. I think I was like a, honestly, like it was like I was like mm, cute boys, and like I, I sure, had like the man. worst reasons for Look, wanting to do it. There are some cute but, boys in this movie. Yeah, um, this is a cute boy movie. But a I got me market yeah, this movie. Yeah, <laughs> but I got like I mean I really like I got all the literature, and I think I had set up like someone from the navy to come to the house, and I wow. ended up canceling it. Um, because like, parents... my mother was like, "What are you talking yeah, about?" Well, your yeah, were like, like, "This is not a good idea." I had you. like sort of come out to my mom at that point. It was just like it, this is way before "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" went away. You know, it was just like a whole fucking thing. Um, it turns out it was good because I graduated in June of two thousand one. Yeah. yeah, good call. Yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. a good call. So I would have been in the military when something bad happened mm, just boy, a few months oh later. Boy, um, what, what was the? Oh, um, Jay Z's album came out and people okay. didn't. I think it was that good. Yeah. Collateral yeah. damage. Yeah. The yeah. Schwarzenegger movie yeah. got yeah. Uh, buried at the yeah, box office. Big trouble got pushed uh, for like six months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they had to edit the pilot of 24. Ellen had to be like serious. <laughs> yeah. they, they had to digitally change the yeah. skyline at the end of Zoolander. Oh, God. How yeah. many of these can we do? Basta. That's yeah. uh, Italian for enough. <laughs> um, what's interesting about that story, Richard, mm-hmm. is that you said like you want to do something you cared about. Yeah. And then you watch the movie again, yeah. you rewatch it, you had this very visceral response, and yeah. you felt like that was the thing to do. But then what you ended up doing in life is becoming a film writer. Yeah. Which like is the thing you care about. And I wonder if there was some degree of just like you putting the feelings in the wrong box. Like you watched right. Saving yeah. Private Ryan, you had this visceral response and you were like, This makes me feel something. I should yeah. do this. Yeah. It's like what you really want to do is write about this. That's exactly right. And I feel like it's one of those kind of like fork in the road things where like there was almost a terrible mistake of youth that I made. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, but and it was Steven. It was almost Steven Spielberg's fault. Uh, yeah, and maybe yeah. Giovanni Ribisi's a little bit. Nope. <laughs> um, Did you want to be a combat medic? They I have don't the know coolest what the fuck I wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I I was too scared to actually think about joining the army. Right. That's the so worst the navy one. was sort of the one that I went to, um, you know, because of the the song. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And McHale's Navy obviously was a huge influence on me. And Darren Periscope, I would assume. Yeah, mm-hmm. again, a movie I wrote, so I don't really feel comfortable <laughs> talking about it. But <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, I'm glad I didn't. Um, but I still do like the movie quite a bit. Although you're right, it does make me feel very different things. I rewatched a, most of it this week, mm-hmm. and in the wake of um, I don't know when this is airing, but the January. election election just happened. Yeah, the election. Real shit. Sorry to. No, blow no, up no. your timing spot, no, but no, we're, um, we're going to be talking about it in every episode. But it, sure. in the wake of that, um, I was like, "Oh, everything's fucking miserable," and you know, it's still a wonderful movie, but it made me feel very different things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've same. Only ever seen it in the prism of the worst. Yeah, yeah, which is I election think election ever. You know, yeah, I, I mean, not that there's necessarily a straight line between like our anxiety right now and the events of this film, you know, but, but. Who fucking know? All bets are off now. I I had like th- this was one of the most difficult movie watching experiences I've ever had. Yeah, I had like a physically uncomfortable time watching this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable. I'm I'm aware. Yeah. Yeah. I'm aware. That yeah. having been said, I was like literally sick to my stomach the entire film. Like I had a I had a really really tough time getting through it, mm-hmm. and I had never tried to watch it before. But I will say, if I like was not watching it for the podcast, right? And I'd just been like, oh, you know what? Big blind spot. You should obviously see Saving Private Ryan turned it on to Netflix. Uh-huh. I would have turned it off within 15 minutes and be like, I, I can't deal with this. D- sure. Do you have that reaction to war films in general? I'm not good with war movies. Yeah, I love and I'll, war I'll movies. I'll say that. Yeah, me too. World War II movies. Yes. I don't especially. like Vietnam movies. I, I'm okay with, but I'm less, yes, I'm also less invested in Vietnam movies. I like uh, movies about uh, Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> when will War, there be you mean wars in the stars? Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, the wars in the stars. Uh, the, your near and far wars. You mean like Death Becomes Her? 
Yes, that's one of them. Oh, yeah, that's a great Star Wars movie. Yeah. That uh, Mega Mind, which was advertised as a feral versus pit. Any movie right. where the the above the title are verses. <laughs> yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Uh, Monster yeah. in Law, I think, was a J Lo versus Fonda. I, I think which, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> the public demanded it, <laughs> so it happened. The I, you know, title bout for all title bouts. I really like Bride Wars. Oh, uh, my hair's blue. Yeah, <laughs> it's blue. blue. Yeah. Uh, Chris Pratt's in that. Is he really? Yep. Yeah. He's one of the fiancés from Humble Beginnings. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I was going to say was, <laughs> I I have... Guys, it feels good to laugh. It, oh, it, it feels so good. <laughs> Immediately, all the pain is gone. I have a kind of block with war movies, I think similar to the way some people do with like fantasy or sci-fi, where they're like, I can't engage with this shit. It just uh-huh. doesn't mean anything. Where it's the opposite, where like I can deal with war shit if it's like orcs <laughs> or if it's in sure. space. <laughs> right. Because then it's like, all of this is ridiculous. Uh-huh. But I, I like... It's it's my own weird psychological thing. I cannot process like war as a concept, and I'm not saying that as me being like a peace loving guy. No, it's just so it's so. And that's why I love these movies, I especially want, on the scale I want to of know something about. like World yes. War II, like yes. a, like an Iraq War movie. Like it's Humvees, it's mm-hmm. improvised explosives. Mm-hmm. It's you know, it feels you're like okay, I could sort of the scale but, is far smaller, right. but like you, a D Day you know. invasion for God's sakes. It's, it's like, crazy. I don't, well, that's the thing. This yeah. is this is like an amazing depiction of the craziest war, right? So it's, like, the hardest to process. But but even when it is a smaller war, I just, like, I'm, like, the least violent person in the world. Like, my brother was three years younger than me. He used to punch me a lot. And my parents, like, made me sign up for boxing lessons because he'd start <laughs> punching me and I would just lay still. And they'd be like, why aren't you fighting back? And I was like, I don't like fighting. And I would just, like, get punched. I'm, like, the only <laughs> so kid. Sad. I'm the only kid in the world whose parents encouraged Maybe you should have joined the military. Yeah, you might have more. needed to get some toughened up. You know, I just don't. I don't like physical stuff. I don't like. No, doing I mean, I don't physical. love it either. Yeah. Really, you know, yeah. Being honest, um, I'm trying to think of other big war movies. So, well, hey, you know, I was going to say, Griffin, I really strongly recommend you do not see Hacksaw Ridge. Yeah, don't see. Yeah, this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Hacksaw out. Ridge now. makes this movie seem like freaking Andy and, Hall. I yeah, don't know. it's yeah. like that movie is everyone going in. Everyone was like, it's really violent. And, and I like, was how like, bad could it it's be? a war movie. Yeah. It's, and then it, the minute, I mean, credit to that crazy old anti-Semite. He really knocks it out of the park. He's a lunatic. <laughs> you're watching that movie and you're like, this guy is fucking, fucking insane. Yeah. It's just the thing. I want to see it because of that, but I'm going to like flip out, right? Well, the problem is that in Saving Private Ryan, like the famous D-Day opening scene. Is right at the beginning. horrifically gory yeah. and like yeah. verite. You know, it just feels very real. And. But it's horrified by it. It's scared of it. And we're supposed to be scared by yes. it. Hacksaw Ridge yeah. is, like, in love with it. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, yeah. and also, he's just, Gibson is just so obsessed with these people who endure the most unimaginable violence. Like, it's he loves, like, stoicism in the face of, like, carnage. Right, which is and, the opposite of what I like. Yeah, and right. whereas this movie's yeah. not like that at all. This movie's basically just, like, nobody really knew what the fuck they were doing. And, yeah. like, you know, it just sort of happened. Uh, whereas Hacksaw Ridge is like, can you believe this guy? Look at him. Look at that. Look at that guy. Look at all them crushed heads. But that's like, I, <laughs> Look at all those limbs flying so everywhere. Bad. It's cra- But at the same time, I do admire Gibson in not a, as a person, though. No. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, you know, like, as a no, filmmaker, he's I got just, good values. He's an incredible film. I can't deny, like, the film was... Uh, you know, it got yeah, to me. He's got a sort of mad genius. But, yes, yeah. but he's, you know, he's a demented madman. Right. Well, and, that's like uh, racist. Well, yeah, Alan, like, I, you know, I can't defend his movies, but I like his personal life. <laughs> it's got a good personal life. I mean, you will meet a tall, dumb stranger. It's unforgivable. <laughs> Everything else? Uh... I like the way he conducts himself on yeah. a day to day basis, especially you know, with those closest to him. <laughs> I'll say, I saw you will awful, meet a tall, awful, dark stranger. Awful. awful. Um, and I thought, okay, Hopkins, he's officially cooked, right? Like, Hopkins is just. He can't give a good performance anymore. He phones everything in. Yeah. Hopkins having a good time right now. On the old West World. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad to see Hopkins doing, you know, fun things again. I yeah. remember reading yeah. an interview with him when Thor was coming out. And he, they said, like, what was it like working on it? And he said, like, it was great. I got the script and I have this thing. When I uh, read through a script, I circle scenes and I write uh, no A-R next to them. And they're like, what does that mean? It goes, no acting required. And that's the best thing in the world. If I just see, I can just show up. I just have to learn the lines. And I read the script and I go, I got a weird helmet on. <laughs> he just I'm going to be on the, the whole set. Script. He said, he said it was great because I read it and every scene was NAR. Oh, and it was like, that was his approach for 10 years. And then he got in his car from the world's fastest Indian and <laughs> zoomed away. He did like a full yeah. 10 years of NAR. And then I feel yeah. like Westworld, he's actually like doing it again. 
Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Hopkins, we talked about him last week. Well, because Hopkins right. did actually build that Westworld thing, right? I mean, like, of that's, course that's, he's committed. Yeah, that's yeah. his project. So yeah. it's... And Hopkins is the father of Thor. <laughs> right. right. He is the all father. I mean, the reason, the reason he didn't have to act at all is because he is Odin. Yeah. When he goes into Odin's sleep every night. <laughs> He rolls over in bed and says goodnight to Rene Russo. And, yeah, takes a yeah. good night's Odin sleep. Um, no, I do think, I mean, all the war movies I like, and there are some, are all movies that I would say are technically another movie set in war. Like, I sure. love Thin Red Line. I love no, MASH. Mask. Sure. I love A Very Long Engagement. I love, you know, but it's like, yeah. that's a romance. That's like a comedy. That's... Metaphysical... Right, yeah. you know, um, and I love. And there's not a lot of violence in Thin Red Line, if I remember correctly. No, I mean there, there's, there's shoot- some. Yeah, there's you know? some, yeah. but it's not as. It's not this. No, it's not. It's more yeah. poetic. Yeah. yeah, and like Best Years of Our Lives, I think is a masterpiece. Sure. Uh, but that's like a movie about war. I can deal with movies like exploring like the notion of war. I can deal with movies in war. I just like. I just go like, well, orcs aren't real. What is the? What I, is love this? I love them. I, I love them. I have a hard time. Movies. World War Two movies. I don't know what is hardwired into. It's my dad telling me stories mm-hmm. about his grandfather. You know, it's me just too. like. I guess it's just in my DNA or something. But. but I think I also just, it's such an uh, unknown and strange thing for me, and I want to know what it was like. Like, I'm really interested in, like, seeing it. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I, I saw Allied recently, uh, sure. the Brad Pitt, yep. Marion Cotillard. Um, we can talk where, about Where it they're now. trying to prove that the moon landing didn't happen. Because <laughs> Marion, it's her passion project. She's really... <laughs> oh my God. I once yeah. interviewed her, and she almost did, said Bush did 9-11, and you could tell her publicist was like, Marion? And she was like, anyway, yes, uh, two days, one night's very good. You know, like, she, like, s- almost switched off track. Do you think she's happy about Trump? Secretly. Maybe. Maybe. She's, um, I love her, but she's, uh, she's cuckoo. Yeah. Don't ruin her <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Anyway, in Allied, you know, there's a, the first half of the movie is his sexy kind of spies and rock. Which I liked a lot. You know, it's, and the second half is, yeah. But, yeah, I agree. But, and, and I can get swept up in that. English Patient is a great example sure. of a mm. World War II movie mm. that's yeah. not about war and I yeah. love. It's sort of off the uh, center of and war. And it covers yeah. the yeah. war. It, yeah. It's engaged right. with the war. Right, Casablanca is good. The problem yes. is when you get swept up in the glamour of, there is a glamour around certain World War II stories, except that fucking horrible things were happening. Except that we were basically just throwing men in front of guns. And I think that for me, in a way, Saving Private Ryan, you know, for my 15-year-old brain, was the first movie I'd seen that was like, oh, right, that was a fucking nightmare. Right. Like, it was not... It's a horror movie. It wasn't glamorous. It wasn't romantic. It wasn't, you know, it was mostly just annihilation on a scale that's unimaginable. Agreed. And yet, I will say, and I feel the same way about Schindler's List, which we haven't discussed in this podcast, but, Uh you know, you... I hadn't seen it at that point. Sure. Yeah. There's there's something about Spielberg. He does he's such a good direct like he does make this stuff like entertaining and gripping, even yeah. as you're also grappling with how bad it is. And Schindler's List especially is really tough because like I've talked about this with friend of the podcast, uh, David Ehrlich, like that movie's so fun. And like the characters are so like vivid and like big and three dimensional you know and you're like really gr- and yet also yeah. of, you know i mean it it's is, not fun yeah and yeah. same remember when it's like that too like it is like it's a dynamic entertaining. and entertaining like action film okay. as well as like a living nightmare so this is where i diverge and once again it's not me throwing yeah, out yeah, a judgment you just of had the a film. bad time yeah, it's last my night. own personal experience yeah. i also realized that independently i had diarrhea the first half of the movie i was you're just saying like, the film wasn't re- when you say independently the film wasn't responsible I mean, I maybe it was. I don't want. No, he put usually the blame has diarrhea with other people. Yes. Oh, I but see. He right, had it right. a this was it. solo yes. diarrhea. Yeah. Usually, I try to team up with someone, double dragon style. <laughs> double dragon. <laughs> yeah. Streets of rage. Good lord. <laughs> um. No, but I. I just like. I was like. I, well, then. Yeah. It became a bad night. But. Um. I. Ju- I just. Uh, it, it so squarely hits all of my sort of triggers of shit I have a hard time comprehending mm-hmm. and things that, like, frighten my does? core. Yes. Yeah. No, but, like, Holocaust stuff, I'm like, this is horrible. It's insane that this happened. It's sure. hard to process, but I accept that it does. And war stuff, every time I'm watching a movie that's set in war, I'm just like, why would anyone do this? Why Why? why, why was this? There's been more wars than Holocaust. I know. Yeah. I know. Mm-hmm. There's at uh, least like three wars. Well, there's there been yeah. zero Holocaust, so that's mm, no, 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 <laughs> oh, no, 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 not after the Mel Gibson jokes. Uh, Marion just said we. Oui. <laughs> well. All right, all right. God, we're in a dark place today, guys. I'm, I'm fucked up by this movie. Can we well, just play the, the, my core. To the Bill Paxton game over, man? Game over. <laughs> yeah, clip. it's, it's been playing it in my head. Yeah, like for... aliens you love, right? Aliens I love because it's like, about fighting aliens. That's a make... Vietnam movie, but of course disguised as an alien. But I go, this is phony baloney stuff. This is no, we don't got bug aliens. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Ask Marion. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we couldn't go to the Marion movie. Marion calls Paul Verhoeven, what do you know about these bugs? 
<laughs> Starship <laughs> Troopers I love. Yeah. Shoot a nuke down a bug hole, you get a lot of dead bugs. Oh. That's uh, my favorite <laughs> line from Starship <laughs> Troopers. Um, all right, so World War II. Yeah, uh, is what this movie is about. The D Day landings, Operation yeah. Overlord. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's the, the it's Allied the, landings it's, in France. It's one side of the larger story that yes. Spielberg later tells the rest of in Band of Brothers, mm-hmm. which I watch every year, once a year, and I cry. You really I, watch I cry the whole every thing, time. whole it's thing, a good once show. a year, every year, and I cry when they're playing baseball at the end, do you, without do you, fail. Do you have the um the the, the like I, DVD box? It's uh, like a big tin. What do you take me for? Of course, I do. <laughs> I know. Just just checking, just checking. Yeah. My mom got it for me for Christmas. You think he's going to own the fucking later Digipack release? Come on. It's like a Richard Lawson. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, that like that 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 Band of Brothers was huge in college when I was in college. Sure. As was Saving Private Ryan. Like, and this movie was huge for me when I was a teenager in terms of like everybody went to see it because it was like so cool. Like it was gnarly. It was violent. Like it in Britain, like people just were. It like, was it was a masculine way to to feel emotion. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing I remember, like friends. Because it of is mine. crazy. This movie was the number one grosser of the year. Like Insane. you said, yeah, you Insane. know, it's and a I, three hour super violent. Yeah, I was nine when it came out, but I remember most of the boys in my grade going to see it and like loving it. Yeah, yeah, you know. And people always talked about like, oh, the first twenty minutes are like intense, but right. it was always kind of this like. It was like going on a roller coaster. Yeah, the way totally. people talk about that it, was, it'd be like yeah, it's scary, yeah. but you feel so fucking good after. It's yeah. visceral, and watching this like. Like, where I diverge from what you were saying about this movie being entertaining, and once again, it's just hitting my my shit, right? But it's like, the I found the first 26 minutes so scarring yep. that I, like, couldn't recover from the rest of it. And the whole time I was like, wow, this is a fucking incredibly well-made movie. Like, I kept it on is. being like, this it's movie is empirically made. great. It's it really, empirically one of the best, most well-directed films I've ever seen. Yeah. I hate watching it. I will never watch it ever again. Yeah. Like, I don't think I could make it through watching it again. So, you and I have probably... How many times have you seen this movie, Richard? I've seen it so many times. Oh, I mean, probably well over 20. Yeah. I yeah. Like, owned it on DVD. I'd watch yeah. it all. I know and, and maybe every like, beat. Bits and pieces. Like, maybe not all in one sitting, you know? But, sure. like... But I'm curious. Like, you know, I was w- watching it this week, and I was like, I can't believe it's almost 20 years old. And I kind of expected mm-hmm. the special effects to be, like... Not really work. Sure, to see the scenes. Still, but so, but seeing it for the first time with fresh eyes, Griffin, like, did it look like a twenty-year-old movie to you, or did it seem absolutely not? Yeah. And I'll say this: I mean, the effects I think are seamless. They are. Um, but but the bigger thing for me that I found interesting was uh, realizing I had seen clips from the movie, I'd seen the trailers, but I never engaging with it a whole cloth. I didn't realize how much of a Rosetta Stone it was in terms of visual style oh, yeah. and editing patterns for so many different movies yeah. and so many different genres in Definitely. the 20 years that followed. And what I find fascinating is it still pulls off all those tricks better than any movie since then. Yeah. yeah. You Absolutely. go to, like, Greengrass is probably the guy who's appropriated the Saving Private Ryan style the best. You, like, the shaky cam thing? It, yes. It, it was, like, new at right. that point. I mean, right. it wasn't new, new. No, but, no, like, but you know it what was. I mean? For it a big mainstream was. film, you know? Yes. But, but then even the sort of elements of the the super desaturated, yeah, the bleach yeah. the grainy, the, the dealing with the different kind of frame rates, the weird like blurs. Like Kaminsky uh, stripped the camera lenses of the protective thing right. to make it seem like more nineteen forties, right. and you know all this kind of cool techniques. Which I stuff. feel like, man. I feel like yeah. Tony Scott pulled a lot of that, and then you go like Greengrass pulled a lot of sort yeah. of the actual like cinematography of the movement of the camera, and then like all this stuff, and it still feels like this is the most cohesive version of all of that, where yeah. every single affectation they're putting on there is for a specific purpose and it works. Yeah, it's like watching Pulp Fiction and you're like, oh, this is when all of that kind of like crime, like indie stuff came from it and it's still better than everything that followed. You 100%. Know, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, but that once again feeds into the like when people like I always hate, hate, hate. It's one of my like least favorite like like film bro gripes. We're like, oh, enough with the shaky cam. Which oh, is like yeah. what the fucking it does. If it's, if oh god, it's, I got nauseous, and it's like okay. If it's it works, the right it tool for the yeah. story, then that's the fucking thing. I don't yeah. like it for its own sake, but like, yeah, um, it's cinematic language, and if it's like mm-hmm. aligned with the themes of the movie and the story, and it's being used intelligently, that's that's good. Yeah, uh, I did genuinely feel sick watching this. Like, and yeah. and a lot of it had to do with the events being portrayed on screen. But also, but I also think, I mean, he uses it very specifically to try yeah. to make you feel that physically disoriented. Yeah, and like you're in the middle of a fucking hurricane. And all those you know? splatters on the camera. Yeah, mm-hmm. all that stuff yeah. is mm-hmm. so well done. But it was, I, I had a very very physical. I mean, I. It, the movie is like three hours long. Yep, two hours and fifty minutes. And you said you were like surprised because you feel like it breezes. It by. just zips by for me. And I think you said you feel like it's sort of its length. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I I had to pause the movie so many times. I think it took me five hours to watch. Yeah. I had to like keep on taking breaks to just sort of like calm myself down. What in what circumstance you were just watching at home? Like alone? I was just watching at home. Yeah. I like turned it on last on... night on Netflix on my TV. Mm -hmm. So it was like in high def. It's on Netflix. I had no idea. It's on Netflix right oh, now. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. And my Wi-Fi it was thankfully like January, working but... well, and I got yeah. it in, like good might quality. Yeah. And I just like uh, yeah, I just like had to keep on pausing and being like okay, 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 you know? Yeah. Um, which once again is like to the credit of the movie. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it's where I'm the app. Hey, we'll get to the plot now, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's like I was watching with Joanna; she'd never seen it, and I would literally be able to be like, "Oh, uh, close your eyes for a second. Someone's about to get like his arms blown off." Like I knew right. everything yeah, yeah, that was the, going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Can yeah I talk, oh, chill out for a sec. Giovanni Ribisi is about to bite it. Yeah. Can I talk about the single most upsetting, like unnerving element of the film for me? And once again, I don't know if this can make me look like a coward oh, or boy, whatever. He's setting up some bit. No, because there, there's, there, I mean, there's, there's a lot morally, you know, cinematically, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of my own personal views, in terms of actually just the film being effective and right in, in its aims. The, the one thing I just couldn't fucking shake. Edward Burns is second build in this movie. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> How the and, fuck did that happen? You, Where were we as a culture? Well, got, we were like brothers McMullining at that point, and out of she's control. the one. I mean, yeah. it's, it's yeah. crazy because the movie. We thought has, he was the one. Well, the thing. <laughs> oh no! Twelve colony points. <laughs> oh god man. I want to go behind lines to I, rescue gonna, that you know joke. what I'm going to go out I need to hit the sidewalks of New York and get out of here <laughs> that was the yeah. stinkiest stinker of them all Heather Graham's well, I'm sorry Finding Kitty I don't even know what that is that's Edward Burns and David Crumholtz as a private investigator looking for his cheating girlfriend looking for Kitty okay that's what it's called apparently it was Edward Burns in that Thorn Birds movie no that's Bill Paxton Edward uh, Burns is in some horrible like I don't know. He's You're not thinking of Hatfields yeah. and McCoys, right? Yeah, yeah he yeah. had. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. had literally only been in the Brothers McMullen, and she's the one. That's and this was his third role, and he had directed both of them. Yes, no, this was his first movie that he had not directed and written, and he was second bill. Well, because he really was like he'd won the Sundance Grand Jury Prize. Yeah, for Brother, like he was he had seen heat. as like hot he had shit. a lot of heat, and he's yeah. you know he's good looking. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. a good looking good guy. Good it, it and this a is a movie of a cast of lots of young, good looking ish. Some of them are more interesting looking. I feel like. Spielberg was good at like picking sort of yeah. realistic looking Character. people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but like, right, a lot of young yeah. talent. Yeah, you know? yeah. Is on stone, and he was seen as a young talent. Well, it, I, yeah. It just it, it is fascinating to this me. This is that, his like, peak. Yes. A after this, it's all down. Pretty much. Yep. It is fascinating to me that this really is an ensemble movie, right? You have Hanks as mm -hmm. like the ringmaster, but other than that, it's really kind of an equal playing field ensemble yeah. in a lot of ways. And the two guys who got like prominent billing and like their faces on the poster and were clearly promoted above the ranks. Or Sizemore and Burns, who are the two guys who have the least interesting careers of everyone in the supporting cast. That's right. true, sure. You know? And, like, Damon then, like, post Goodwill Hunting, they kind of put him more into the marketing. But well, he he's also filmed it role. before right. yeah. all that happened. And Spielberg was reportedly really upset that Matt Damon got famous because right. he didn't want it to be like that. And I, I don't know. I mean, He wanted he, to be, like, the audience was thrown yeah. off because he seemed innocuous. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How and, many movies has Damon just popped up in? in the well, I mean, life? that's not a lot, yeah. 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 But I think there's, I mean, you guys are doing this whole series on Spielberg, and something, one of the most interesting things to me about him is his casting because, yes. you you know, he'll cast, like, one big, big star, and then, mm. you know, maybe, like, a Colin Farrell in Minority Report or whatever. Yeah, sure. right. but up and comers. But, like, you know, he'll put... Francis O'Connell in AI She's or great. or Catherine Morris in Minority Report or mm. you know, Amy the, Adams in Catch Me If You Can. Oh, yeah, these kind of like he'll find these kind of I mean it happens a lot more with actresses I guess than actors because he yeah. doesn't tell a lot of women led stories but but like Mark yeah, Rylance. He just ha yeah, yeah, Mark Rylance. Like he has this really he he seems very resistant to stacking his movies with with big names because with Saving Private yeah. Ryan, he could have gotten fucking anybody he wanted. Well, you compare it you to Thin Red Line. Right, which right. which right. I love, but but it's like John Cusack suddenly shows up for two scenes. Well, yeah, and that's the. Yeah, but I, I think mean, that's I think that's with, with, in Malick's case, that's how he gets his movies funded. Right, right. Yes, everyone yes. will do it. Yeah, right. But, you know, I've told you the Thin Red Line story with George Clooney, where he's in that one scene where he's giving a speech. He enters the movie at two hours and thirty and, minutes, and he yeah, there was yeah. like a whole Clooney subplot that Malick cut out, and Malick called him and said, "I'm cutting. Sorry, I'm cutting almost everything, but we do keep that speech." And Clooney was like. Are you kidding me? Cut the speech. Jesus Christ, I can't yeah. be in what I'm going to look ridiculous. And he was like, no, no, we have to have the speech. Yeah. Which, I mean, I don't know that you do. I mean, I love that movie. But. I, I mean, I think it adds 
a weird power to that movie. This is an episode to talk about that no. movie, and I understand why it works. It does. And I'm not bemoaning Malik for doing that. But a but lot of people complained about it when they saw it. Like, I'm that sure. was a hit on the movie. It's like, hey, this is distracting. Like, you can't keep throwing movie stars at me. I think metatextually it, it works in the film's favor because it kind of makes it clear that, like, oh, every supporting character, like, everyone in the war is as, as valuable as anyone else in the war. Mm-hmm. Mm, sure. You know, like, John Cusack isn't the lead character, but the yeah. second John Cusack comes on screen, you know it. He yeah. matters because he's John Cusack and you've right. seen him in other movies. And and Malik did originally cast a no name as his lead, but then famously, you know, the Adrian Brody story where he yeah. went to the premiere with his family. He was the lead character didn't in the know book. that he'd been cut yeah. out. Right. Like that they cut all the scenes. Yeah. Basically. He's in he's like got one, one line. scene. Yeah. He has one yeah. line where he goes, They're coming. Yeah. And it happens I mean, two hours. And in. he didn't know, which is like horrifying, but maybe that's sure. what turned him bad. Yeah. <laughs> Adrian Brody. Yeah. Well Sean Paul. What was that? Was that the oh, Adrian Brody? <laughs> yeah. And Paul F. Tompkins and Scott Ackerman talking about that on Comedy Bang Bang is very funny. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. I love yeah, that. Yeah. It's a great bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, Adrian Brody's bit was great. Um, I agree. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Should have bring, yeah. bring him back. <laughs> Justice for Brody. Yeah. 50 comedy points. <laughs> um, but, yeah. No, the casting in this is incredible. And I do find it interesting that he picked so many people. I mean, you look at the variety of the people in this cast mm-hmm. and the careers they went on to have in totally different spheres. Yeah. Like, it's not just like. Oh, he picked the next five big stars. No. You know? I mean, Nathan Fillion shows up. Brian Cranston's in there. And Paul Giamatti's Teddy in there. D. Well, and the little known actor named Ted Danson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I and that was like, I think, just like, a, hey, they're friends, you know. But, sure. But he just, Spielberg has an eye for it, but you, you, but in the, you know, initial thing without, you know, kind of knowing what what's to come, mm. it seems like he's just finding these kind of like random actors who work in the texture of the movie and doesn't really much care with, you know, if he has his hanks mm-hmm. and that's all he needs. Yeah. And then everyone else is just, you know, going to be the best for the role, which I think is really cool and yes. and kind of. Well, and uh, he does a good job not putting it in your face. Like, I think if you, you, I mean, look, you you know, it's Paul Giamatti, but like, you never see like a, a one of Paul Giamatti's face. You know, he's mm-hmm. in this like messy, rainy scene. He's got a helmet on half the time. But but you're also saying, you know, it's Paul Giamatti. In 1998, Paul Giamatti was most prominent, prominently pig vomit. Like, I, it, I know. he didn't I have yeah. that much. No, I, I know, but that's, I'm just saying he's not drawing even yes. Ted Danson. You yeah. you know it's Ted Danson, but like he's not like drawing attention to these actors. Right, they're in a a larger tapestry. Yes. that he's yes. woven. Yeah, well, and with Janusz's beautiful Polish hand. I kept on. Yeah. He's got great hands. I kept on thinking about. There's this uh, William Friedkin. Fried, Fried Quinn. Jesus Christ. This William Friedkin quote about a uh, sorcerer. Where the studio really wanted him to hire Steve McQueen. And he was like, I want Scheider. Scheider's my guy. Scheider's my muse. And then the movie bombed really hard. And he wanted, he was like, I don't want a big star. I don't want to overpower it. I want to shoot in the real jungle. And I want to have real faces and all this sort of stuff. And he said when the movie bombed, he realized that like uh, one second of one close-up of Steve McQueen was worth so much more than shooting in that real location and having all those effects and whatever. Right. And he wasn't talking in terms of box office gross. He was talking about sort of like an ability to engage with the audience. And this movie does that so well where it's like even just in the first 26 minutes where like most of the dialogue is inaudible. It's happening over like such a cacophony of like sound and chaos. Mm -hmm. But just when we cut to a close up of Tom Hanks, even though it's him shaking and blood Mm -hmm. splattering everywhere, there's like a sense of like, okay, I I know we're in good hands. Like I don't feel comforted that Tom Hanks is in this movie, but I feel secure that we're going to make it. Yeah. And even though Tom Hanks had been in, you know, a brief Vietnam War scenes in Forrest Gump, this was Tom Hanks like, oh, my God, we'd never seen him in so much peril yeah. and, you know, bloody and, yep, you know, that's shooting true. people. I mean, this was like a whole new thing for him. I mean, not to spoil, but is this the first Hanks death? I think this is the first Hanks death in a movie. No, uh, Philadelphia. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Um, or does he? But is he dead at the end of that? I, movie? Don't, I think. Uh, oh God, it's been but, 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 but I think it's, I it, is it the first time we see Hanks kill somebody? Good call. Has to be. Yeah. Probably, right? Yeah. Except in Big when he kills the fortune teller. But she deserved it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that And in Punchline was. when he murders on stage. He does. That's true. Um, but, but the bigger he thing. He slayed me, that audience. Yeah. The bigger thing for me watching this is this is like the first time I think he had been this minimalist. Yeah. He's so small in this movie. And haunted. And, yes. Yeah. He's fabulous in this movie. It's the first time he really seems like a full. Grown up, I think, mm. and that's a mode he's playing that's a, a lot call, in right actually. now. Yeah. This you was, were talking. The you're other right. Day. This is the beginning yeah. of that. Because he's phase a young gay man dying of AIDS in Philadelphia. He's mm-hmm. like kind of like Nafe going through the world in Forrest, Forrest Gump, Gump. Yeah. and this is like, oh, he's like a grown up. He was always kind of plucky. Oh, no, Apollo 13, be, it, maybe Apollo 13. 
Sure. Yeah, this yeah. is actually similar to his Apollo 13 role, where he's kind of like this cool, steady hand, you know, at the center of everything. But he's so haunted. But in he literally this. doesn't yes, have he, a steady he, hand. He is, he is so... He does not have a steady hand. You're a good call. He's so small in this. I mean, watching his yeah. big monologues, because Apollo 13, the whole point is like, oh, the stoicism is that he's like this American hero. Yeah. He's like cool and calm and collected, even under pressure. But in this, the big monologues he has are all like, you look like he barely moves his face. You know, he doesn't feel the need to like overplay the hand. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And we, you and I, Richard, were talking a lot about recently. I've also talked about with you independently that, like, I, I'm fucking loving this current Hanks run. Yeah. These last, like, five or six years of Hanks, I think he's found this pocket of playing, like, dudes who are just really good at their jobs. Yeah. And just Unshowy playing, about like, it. Yeah. Real, like, American grown ups. Yeah. You know? Which we need. Right. Without any sort of, like, mannerisms, which uh, Hanks is great when he wants to be, you know, heightened. I mean, he's obviously, like, a great comedic actor when he wants to be. And even when he has to play more character parts in a dramatic context, he's great at that, too. Mm-hmm. But he's really, really stripped down, bare bones, like, just existing on screen now. And this feels like the first time he did that. And then he didn't do it a lot again for the next 10 or 15 years after yeah. that. And then he yeah. sort of come back to it. Well, he does Castaway. That's his big follow-up to this movie, right? But Castaway's such, like, a high-wire actor. Oh, I know. Thing, I love Castaway, you know? but it's yeah. a totally different kind of... I'm trying yeah. to think of, like, other immediate things that Hanks does after this movie. Yeah, because then you go, I mean, Green Mile, Toy Story 2, The Green Polar Mile Express. Green Mile is the next year. Ugh. Yeah, he had, had a weird... Can. He has a weird run. run there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Road Ca- to Perdition. And Catch Me If You Can is such a character thing with the weird he's accent. He's yeah. so good in that movie. He's great, but... Yeah, he's big. But, yeah, yeah big, yeah. big supporting role, yeah. very much. Yeah. Uh, right, Road to Perdition, which I also think he's excellent in. But Road to Perdition is maybe the the next time we see this version of him. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'll say it is interesting that, you know, obviously a huge part of this movie is that Tom Hanks is this, like, unknowable, like, incredible. Like, he's like this dark hero to his company, right? Sure. Yeah. They yeah. all are, like, guessing it, like, oh, he's such a fucking at, Terminator. At, at least Sizemore has been with him since the uh, battle. And they mentioned very briefly in Tunisia. Right. So they've been all kind of all over the place right. and, you know. And Sizemore's hell. playing Tom Sizemore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, Very well. Dark Norbeth! Um, but uh, Hanks is so lovable. Maybe it's just Hanks. Well, he's just a grounding presence. Yeah, that sometimes yeah. you're like, I don't know, I, sometimes I have trouble with the movie, when the movie's trying to sell me on, like, how intimidated they are by him. Even though I think it works. Sure. You know what I mean? Just yeah. like, he's such a he's sweetheart. So, yeah. Like, the idea that they can't imagine that he's a school teacher. When it, and it's it, like, of course he is. He yeah, coaches and, baseball. Of course he is. And of yeah. course, like, that's the point of the big speech he gives, yeah. which is like, hey, in the real world, of course I'm, I'm a regular school teacher. Guy. But also, he's intimidating in exactly the way a school teacher is intimidating. Totally. Yeah. When you want to impress him. Like, a this calm person's authority. a nerd. He's like an English composition teacher. He loves words this much. But, but it's like you're. He's kind of unknowable. He's keeping a wall between himself and the students, mm-hmm. you know? And and he creates a dynamic where you want to win over his affection and his respect. And uh, I think that's crucial for the movie because you need to understand why when he says, like, all right, you three, you have to go there now. Right. Yeah. And where they're shooting the guns at the blank space that you need to occupy, you know, and then yeah. people are like, okay, all right, we're doing yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. He's also, I mean, it's actually a, uh, it's a really clever script, um, you know. And sorry, is, do you hear someone scraping at a bowl? Oh, actually, I do. Who is that? Oh, hey, it's me. <laughs> Please, sir, can I have some more? I was just eating cereal. <laughs> On my... Not gruel? No, I turned it... I was... I moved away from the mic. Ben, it's fine. I'm sorry. My apologies. Wait, Ben. Huh? I'm so proud of you. What? Eating on mic. Oh, yeah. Good job. My but little I... producer, Ben. My Ben Deucer. Yeah. My producer, Ben. My poet laureate. My tiebreaker. My peeper. My fuckmaster. My not Professor Crispy. My dirt bike, Benny. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Well, um, you graduated to certain titles yeah. over the course of different miniseries. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're gonna do what you Come on, ben. man. Ben, say Ben Night Shyamalan. <laughs> say Benny thing. Yeah. I have to say, you saying "my fuck master" in a little sing song voice. <laughs> my fuck master. <laughs> my fuck is a really weird thing to hear midday on a Friday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm proud. Thanks, Griffin. You didn't give him his Cameron title. I gave oh, T Ben Thousand. Did we settle on one? No, Ailey Benz. Ailey Benz. I don't know. Ben, do you like this movie? Yes, absolutely. It's fantastic. <laughs> what do you like about it, Ben? I like war movies. Okay. And I like Tom Hanks. Yeah, did all. Uh, and I like headshots. There's quite a few of those. Oh boy, movie. love it. No, I mean, just it's a fucking. Uh, it's a 
uh, uh, look into what my grandfather and his brothers experienced fighting in the war. And that's just like usually how I sort of uh, experience that movie is thinking about it from their perspectives. They're getting to see it from their perspectives of that pretty awful stuff we call war. That's a beautiful thing to say, Ben. And and I, I just want to say that if you like headshots, you should go upstairs to Ripley Greer Studios. Boom! That's a joke for four people. <laughs> That's a joke for the people who work in this office. Yep. All right. So what do you guys like the D-Day landing sequence? It's good, right? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's it's um it it set precedent for something that I don't think what you were talking about earlier has never been met. Mm. I mean, like, right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Like Hacksaw tries it, but it's just no, yeah, that too idea different. Of trying to communicate chaos without just completely befuddling and the audience. And how much of it is actually one one take? It's a good question. I would have to. I mean, like, there are cuts. Down. Obviously, there are, there yeah. are plenty of cuts. But, there, but it's long takes. Yeah. There are lots of long yeah. takes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say the only thing that kind of captures that that sense of like perfectly executed chaos like that is the door chase sequence from Monsters Inc. You are a child. <laughs> you I need to like put away childish movies. things. <laughs> I like it when the monsters are going through all the magic doors. <laughs> God. Hey, you guys like America? Yeah. yeah it's sure. Uh, well, well uh, used to, used yeah, to. Well, yeah. that's six out of ten. I mean, like, <laughs> these these men were fighting yeah. For a country and like believed in it, I think they were yeah, also fighting to liberate people from a bad mm -hmm. force. You know, I think Europe, it was kind yeah. of a, that's why I think that's why World War II is so captures the the fancy of so many people because it was a, 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 right, a righteous kind of well, and that's you know, geez. right. It was like such a quote unquote like good or right. important war that like right. then people were like, oh, we should do like more wars, yeah. and then all the other ones they did were like, like yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, six out of ten. Yeah, well, now, think of yeah, this it's the same movie. thing that happened in the Big Mama's House franchise. What were you saying, Ben? Oh, I was, like think of this movie in comparison with American Sniper. It's like, ugh, yeah, God, exactly. modern yeah. warfare is disgusting. Yeah, sure, and yeah, it sucks. and I think some films capture how weird and dispassionate and gross modern warfare. There is, and others don't, right? Don't in the know. Valley of Allah, the best movie about the Iraq War. Have you? I've That's never seen that movie. It's not even. A, it's not even set in Iraq. Yeah. Monsters Haggy. University gets at some of it too in an allegorical way. Sure, yeah. <laughs> it's a good. That was. A good I, I loved to that your essay in film comment about that. <laughs> it was really powerful. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I love. I personally love uh, Black Hawk Down, actually, which is a movie that not everybody loves about about a sort of forgotten conflict. Yes, yeah. and also, but to me, about like the weird uh, dispassion of talk about of cute boys war. too. Holy moly, they're all boy, in that boy. one. Boy, Ridley got them all there. Josh yeah, Hartnett, really, yes, sir. He took his butterfly net and he <laughs> just went wild in that. Uh, today's field. special is veal. He was like, "What's Richard's <laughs> Netscape search history?" <laughs> Veal. Yeah, like <laughs> Jesus. A, lot, a lot of prime cuts of veal in that movie. Yeah, true, so we've so. gotten we've gotten fuckmaster and a sing song voice, my fuckmaster, and now veal. <laughs> Yikes! Yikes, indeed. This but, is like Island Woman. Oh, Island oh, Woman! Remember yeah. that Bella yeah. Bambina, great <laughs> World War II movie. Oh, he, Captain Carol's Way to Live is my favorite. World a War mas movie. masterpiece yeah. of, uh, of of the horrifying <laughs> theater of war in the Greek <laughs> island. But that's a, I like that war movie because that's. That's about music. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. It's about Penelope Cruz's it's Greek about the accent. Music. Yeah. Okay. So, the yeah. Uh, first 26 minutes of this movie. Here's a hot take. I think if that had been the whole movie, he still would have won uh, Best Director. Yeah. I think if the mm -hmm. movie was literally 26 minutes long. In the way that The Walk sh should have, the Zemeckis movie should have just been The Walk because it was really great and everything else about it was stupid. I would have paid the yeah, same yeah. amount of money. I would have paid $20 yeah, to just see those that. 15 it's, minutes. Yeah. It's really true about The Walk. Yeah. No. I, I, anyway, whatever. Um, but you're right. I'm not here to it, but, the walk. But I think that I think that the, the, walk. the the really the, the amazing strength of saving <laughs> talking the walk is that uh, oh I can't wait for your your spinoff podcast. Talk, yeah, and talk, talk and walk. Talk and walk. Yeah. Walk talk. Um, <laughs> yikes! <laughs> and you would do it all in a, a cheesy French accent. Oh hello! <laughs> uh, was that very Italian? Yeah. What am I doing? Would right. you believe it? Right. Me hosting a podcast. Settle down, Captain Corelli. We recorded the whole uh, thing inside the torch of the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Oh, oh God, God, that's right. Dad, remember when he has his ID card? Yeah, remember oh. when that movie's the fucking worst? <laughs> oh, but those, well, those just, 15 minutes are unbelievable. We just two Zemeckis movies on this podcast. Now, should we go in on another? And, and we talked about Death Becomes Her. Well, this is like Zemeckis oh, chat. Well, uh, we, we, we mentioned Castaway. When, when, the, B Castaway, when, when the BBC did their poll, mm -hmm. that I put that in my top 10 of the 2000s. That's a great movie. I love that movie. I love that movie. We've talked about four Bobby Z movies? We've talked about four. Yeah. Well, should we get a fifth in? Like, is this what? secretly becoming Pod Zemeckast? 
Okay. Let's move it along. Um, Any other D-Day uh, thoughts? I was going to say <laughs> that, as Griffin pointed out, based on these 26 minutes, he probably would have still won Best Director. But what this movie does amazingly is that what comes after it, it doesn't feel like a it slumps or anything. No, it's it a just movie. keeps going. It's such a well structured movie. It is. It's it's really it's a it's a kind of a detective movie. It's mm-hmm. a road trip movie. Yes. I mean, it's a lot of different kind of things that all you know wrapped. It's in a this, buddy comedy. It's a buddy comedy wrapped in this horrifying package. Yeah, and it's a film. So to me, like the idea, I think a lot of people, not a lot, but I remember there was some complaint that like. Spielberg found this sort of cheesy narrative for his World War II movie, right? Like this idea of them trying to rescue uh, this boy, you know, and there's that very stirring uh, Harvey Presnell as George Marshall. Speech. I love him. I love it, too, where he reads or, the Abraham Lincoln and then, letter. And then he puts the letter down. It's clear he's just got it memorized. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that's we what makes Spielberg Spielberg. Those details. There. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the Presnell pause when he goes, the mother of five, sons killed. Like, it's just yes. like this great, like, I don't know. It's just so well done. We are going to get him the hell. Oh, and I have to there. say, the, I, want, um, I could do it all day. The, so yeah, so it goes from D Day to cut cutting to the the office that's yeah, processing these tests. We can't talk about the first twenty six yeah, minutes. So no, let's just go to that. Uh, yeah. first twenty six minutes. Horrifying. Yeah. No, but they're incredible. And they they're storm, incredible, they, but they basically they free an, a, a section of beach so so tanks can. Yeah, Oma, it's Omaha yeah, Beach. Yeah. 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 Um, do you folks know that Charles Durning was like in one of those boats? That Charles Durning was like a friendly right? guy landing on the beaches of that's Normandy. Crazy. Hey man, there's wow. there's an amazing YouTube video. One of my favorite actors of all time, R.I.P. But there's an amazing video I recommend to all Blankies out there uh, of him at, like, the 100th anniversary of D-Day at, uh, at the White House. And Tom Hanks introduces him. And cool. Charles Durning just tells the story. I wish and it's I the most Charles haunting Durning thing. Right uh, he was, he's, Doesn't Josh Rubin do a good Charles Durning? We should get him He back did a great this. Charles yeah. Durning. Yeah. 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 Oh, all right. Um, but, yeah, um, so it goes to the war office. Yeah. And basically they Hard find out. Hard cut Cranston. One-armed Cranston. Yeah. And so there was this thing, this real-life thing with the Sullivan brothers where uh-huh. they were all they were all in the same boat because they wanted to stay together. The boat sank and they all died and this family lost all their sons, basically. Oh, like the Arthur Miller plan. Um, except not. But um, but anyway, so they find out that three of the Ryan brothers have been killed. Two right. two in Europe, two on the one in New, in New Guinea. So you're saying right. this was sort of loosely inspired by yes. that family. Yeah. So and I think, they I think they referenced the Sullivans even in the movie yeah, at I think one you're point. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't, is it in this sequence where we watch the car drive up the, the road in Iowa and the, the yes, mother yes, and yes. That's that, when she with the walks Lincoln out mother. onto yeah. the porch and does that, when she sees the chaplain get out of the car and she does that like wobble and then like has to, it's like, ugh, it's, it's seared into my brain. Why well, I, I talked about in the lost world episode, like, and, and these are things we're going to keep saying in every fucking episode of this, even when the movies are bad, but like Spielberg's so good at blocking, right? Yeah. And getting this sort of, especially in this movie where you have these really long takes and you're going around these crazy large amount of spaces with a ton of characters and it always feels very organically laid out. It never Mm -hmm. feels like Vin Diesel's on his mark, even though you know everyone has to be so precisely landing in the right place. And he always just has everything framed perfectly. But the other thing is, and this movie is a really good argument for this, he's so good at knowing when to convey shit through a gesture, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Just these little things, uh, you know, like Presnell looking up from the sheet. Yeah. Or the wobble of the mother. Mm-hmm. He understands, like, these very small moments. Or uh, old Hanks, these little yeah. shaky hands. Stuff. Yeah. And yeah. it even feels to me like, you know, and I'm projecting here, but, like, you know, and this is, like, a thing they, they say about, like, filmmaking is, like, know when you don't need the line there. Like, the line in the script is to explain it so that the actor understands or the director understands, but you can cut the line and find a way to convey it visually. And yeah. there are a lot of moments in this movie where it's like a shittier director would have had a character say that. And he knows how to do it in like a glance. Agreed. Right. I want to finish my point. Or do yeah. you want to? No, finish no. your point. Just about this story, which yeah. we were talking about, the Private Ryan story, which yeah. is cheesy. Yeah. Right? And like that Lincoln letter is cheesy. And Harvey Presnell is kind of cheesy when he's like, yeah. I love it. I'm, not, I'm just it's whatever. Right, it's righteous cheese. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I do, and like, the, so the whole premise of the movie is these eight guys are, you know, banded into a little company to try and find Ryan. And, like a band of brothers, yeah. Yeah, one could say. Uh, we marry few. And, and one uh, would say just a few years later. Exactly. <laughs> At, uh, um, so, uh, and the whole time they're going, they're debating, like, what the fuck is the point of this? There's eight of us, like, putting our lives on the line for one guy. And it is, like, to me, a perfect metaphor for the foolishness of, like, war. I agree. You know, mm-hmm. like, at, at, and at the same time, like, the noble, no, no, the nobility they're in, right? Yeah. Like, it's like... That contradiction, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and, and the idea that they are debating it the whole time. I, I love that scene where Hanks, 
uh, where Miller, Captain Miller, is there like, uh, well, if you were griping, what would you say? And he says, I think this is that's a great was, use of military resources. That's what resources. I was referencing when, you know, the, how clever the script is. Yes, like, yes. You know, and something they like about Miller, the, the, the grunts, uh, you know, in his command, is that he's witty and, like, he right. has a kind of good, cool authority in that way. And, exactly. Like, yeah. he's not going to break authority and they respect that, but he also is going to, like, wink at them and sort of be self-aware and not yeah. just, like, bark orders at them like a robot. When the setup of the pool about if they can get him to reveal personal details is, yeah. like, such a good device mm-hmm. that also says so much about every character. So yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. let's go through the company. I want to go through the company. Oh, yeah. So we've okay. talked about Hanks. We've talked about Eddie Burns yeah. as a fuck? BAR gunner. The least uh, interesting Richard guy Ryman. in the group, right? Yeah, he's all right. I think it's about the least interesting character and performance. I don't think either is bad, but I think... I think he's the most um, classic sort of World War II uh, GI kind of guy, right? Like sure. He's always the New York guy. Yeah. Exactly. You think he's yeah. from Brooklyn? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and he's he's got the BAR, so he's got the big gun. That's yeah. the, uh, and then so you got Tom Sizemore as Sergeant Horvath, who's mm-hmm. like the second in command. Yeah, he's like yeah. the fall in guy. You know, and he's like, got and he's got the good like bomber jacket on. Like he's got like he, he's got like a different outfit. And he's you know? constantly yeah. covered in some sort of like ash or dirt. Yeah. Like right, he he's yeah. just never clean. Oh, he's like a pile of deli meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like a human I think cold he's cut. Great, and yeah. he's great. He's in. Bringing Out the Dead the next year, and she's fantastic. Oh, in. yeah, he's He'd great been in, in Strange Day. Like, this was his moment. He was where, doing well. Yeah. Uh, and we should Crashes know. right after this. Yeah, yeah, he's a total wackadoo. Um, but uh, he's a pretty good actor back in the day. Uh, yeah, what else is he? Uh, he's in Pearl Harbor, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's like his last. He's in Black Hawk Down, which he's very good in. So both of those Similar are 2001. Yeah, God, yeah, yeah. he was in D-Day and Pearl Harbor. And and the that's Battle of Mogadishu. Really is terrible. terrible. God. Yeah, and Heidi Fleiss. <laughs> So uh, you've got uh, Barry Pepper. Uh, yeah, what are we having to Barry Pepper? As Daniel Jackson, so good in Twenty Fifth Hour. A and few re- years later, yeah. Just and and the um the during the D Day invasion, the shot when he's you know sniping and it zooms in on his eye. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? Are, what is this? This is so stylish. I, I just like. I mean, there's so many interesting things happening. I mean, um, once again, proof that Spielberg's such a a good filmmaker. Yeah. He knows to put a little pepper on the dish. <laughs> He's got such a face. Spielberg casts some real faces. Like, Mary Pepper's got such a weird face. That's why he's got faces out the ass. Um, He was also, well, of course, right. That's what happened to Mary Pepper is he was in Battlefield Earth, and that, like, ruined his career. That's right. Is he a Scientologist, or was it he just got roped I actually don't think so. Too much pepper. I don't don't think. He's Canadian. Um, But he's really good in 25th Hour. He's really good in that movie, uh, The Three Burials of Melchiades Estrada, the Tommy Lee Jones movie that is. With January Jones. Yeah, Forgotten by Time, but he's fabulous. Not by Can. They love that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's really good in uh, Lone Ranger. Uh, he and there, yeah, he's yeah. good in the Lone Ranger. Yeah, okay. I always like him. I'm still excited whenever he shows. Oh, he's really fucking good in True Grit. Yeah, he oh, is good in yes. True Grit. I always right. forget. Yes. yes, but he's All right, really so he's good actually been in some. He's around some some he big works. stuff. Yeah, but he likes to he likes to disappear into the tapestry a little. He's a chameleon. He's Tom you know? Tom Hardy esque in that utility. Way. Yeah. Um, you got Adam Goldberg as Fish. Yeah. Uh, the Jewish member of the party. Yeah. Uh, who's well, pretty yeah good at I mean, as Adam Goldberg often is, he's a Brimming over with rage at all times. Yeah, because right? certainly by 1944, everyone knew that something really awful was happening. Yeah, with Jewish people. yes. Yeah. Although yeah. I think when they arrived at the death camps, like a lot of, I think no one knew the extent of it. But right. yes, exactly. people knew. And, and one, one of the most shattering episodes of Band of Brothers. Yeah, and also, but uh, you know, yeah, Hitler. You know, his anti-Semitism was, was much yeah. discussed. Yeah. You know, in yeah. the 20s and 30s, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was just people were sort of like, oh, well, you know, what's he going to do? Someone asked me once, they were like, uh, what's the name of that Jewish actor? And I was like, okay, first of all, this is fucking offensive. The fact that you just say that. Wh- who are you trying to talk about? And they were like, oh, the guy in Days of Confused. I was like, oh, no, no, Adam Goldberg. Okay, right. That is the right description. <laughs> I think he's the one guy you could call that uh, He's in a actor. movie called The Hebrew Hammer in which he plays yeah. said. That is true. Yeah, that yeah. is true. That was like, supposed that, to be his breakout. That angry Jewish guy. Um, yeah, he was uh, Chandler's weird roommate and friends around this mm-hmm. time. He's really good in this. The kid, he is, he, and in Days Confused, he's the guy yeah. who punches the guy who looks like Chris Cornell, and I thought for yeah. years was Chris Cornell, but it's not. It's a so much Nikki rage. Cat? Um, oh, in Days and Confused, maybe it maybe? is Nikki Cat. I think. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is probably his best dramatic performance, right? Probably, although you know he's done a lot of good work over the years. But yeah, think, he's he's yeah. a sort of an un. Uh, Unheralded guy. Not to spoil anything, but I think he certainly has the most gruesome death in the movie. No he question. Does. That oh, I mean, of the, the main worst. of the main people, yeah. and the yeah. most sort of emotionally disturbing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, then you got Vin Diesel as Adrian Caparza, my everyone's boy. favorite. 
Mm-hmm. A small role Spielberg had seen a little short he made, multifacial, and tossed him in there. I mean, talk about casting a face. She reminds know? me of my sister, so. He's so, don't you agree? He's so, really uh, terrific. There's a really marvelous ten bit minutes, of physical acting that he does. Um, when he's picking when, up the when, apples? Well, that's really the great. The apple bit's incredible. Oh, the apple thing is really good, but then when he gets shot and he falls down on the piano. Yes. And then, like, it's like, I, you know, tries to stand. Mm-hmm. And it's just, like, this really marvelous, like, it's almost balletic in a way. You're um, totally right. I don't think of him in that, in those, in those terms. But, yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's why I'm actually surprised that you'd never seen the movie before, because I figured just as, like, a Vin complete. That was always the largest incentive I had. The block was always, it's a warm movie. I'm not going to have a good time watching this. But the Vin thing was always pushing me. And I thought he was in it less than he was. I mean, he's the first guy in the group to but die. But he has some moments, you know. And he's, yeah. and he's pretty prominently sort of placed for that first chunk. Um, he is, yeah. I mean, you I talk pay about, attention to detail. You know that that the little line he has about you know I always watch the details. You yeah. talk about Spielberg casting faces. Mm-hmm. All these guys got really distinct faces and really distinct voices. Yeah. In a movie like this, especially when you have such a kinetic, disorienting style, and it is a war film, they're all wearing the same clothes and the same helmet. It really does help to be like you're not going to mistake anyone else for Vin Diesel. Sure. No, it's true. You're not going to mistake anyone for Jeremy Davies or yeah. well, you know, yeah, exactly. Pepper. Yeah. These are all very, very different actors. Yeah, yeah no, you, that's, that's true. Really true. Do you mind your BC? As, as the medic. As medic. That's Irwin sort of haunted, Wade. who has that wonderful monologue, I guess it is, in the church where he's talking about his mother. Then, you know. And he's the one who copies out Vin Diesel's letter mm-hmm. uh, to mm-hmm. get the blood off of it. R- uh, Rabisi, an actor, I, he I has like a also lot. a really emotionally devastating death. I yes. would say. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. Um, he's an actor I like a lot, and I don't say this in a negative way, but he can definitely like make a meal out of mannerisms oh, when he sure. wants to. Yeah. You know, he can be really. I sort think of he often gets cast yeah. by people who are like, "Who should play this squirrely little weirdo in yeah. our movie for and ten minutes? Him. Let's get Giovanni Ribisi in and here. Look, and I just think dial it up when yeah. it's the right movie. Yeah, sure. And and that's the fun thing to do is to dial it up. I'm not saying in a negative way, but he he is also very very restrained in this film. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes. you look mm-hmm. at that monologue where it's yeah. especially like I was watching it. And I was like, oh man, this is one of those monologues that like if you're in a shitty acting class, every young actor would want to sure. do. Yeah. To show how sensible, you know, and like uh, restrained they are with their emotions, but he really he he holds it back. Yeah, no, and he's he's not playing a weirdo at all. He's no. he's playing. Yeah. I think he he seems he's to one me, of the most normal, and one grounded, of the smart, yeah. smarter, Straight more sort narrow, of, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he was your prime cut in this movie. If you had to do a power ranking of um, cuties and saving Private Ryan, he was definitely. I mean, he was yeah. He was a sort of. I was into him for a, a while, um, and I. I, I mean, you don't like where you know Ed Burns. A... Ed Burns at the time, oh, yeah. he's so cute. Uh, don't judge. Joanna was, was like, it was, "Who is that?" We didn't know it was ninety-eight. Yeah, look at that know. hair. Well, he looks great in this. Then movie. he has the and thing the at stubble. the end about the lady with the boobs and everything, and I was like, "Ooh, sexy!" You know, I don't know. You want to carry on, please? Nope. No, I'm not. I'm not going to stop right <laughs> Ooh, there. Ooh, sexy. Thanks. Now, uh, Jeremy Davies, one of my favorite, yeah. favorite, favorite character actors. Yeah. As Same Umpum, here. Yeah. Cartographer and interpreter. He was on Lost. Also a great. Physical oh, acting geez. bit when the he's trying when, yeah, when he's trying to get his gear, yeah, incredible, yeah. and that is almost Chaplin esque where he like then the, the shelf falls down, and he's yeah. trying to fix the shelf, and, and that's all that. a warner. Yeah, that whole scene there pretty much of, plays yeah. out. There, there are uh, yeah. Germans, uh, you know, and, and Tom Hanks is just standing there letting him do it. It's it's really Hanks good. is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's uh, my favorite performance in the movie. I mean, I'm deep in the pocket for Davies. Well, yeah. so he had been in um he'd been in Spanking the Monkey, which right. was his big breakout role, the first David O. Russell movie, which he's phenomenal in. Right. And, he and also he'd been done in like Nell and Twister. Yeah. He's one of those actors that I adore. Yeah. He's definitely a type. You know, he's got yep. his thing. Yeah. He can modulate his thing, you know, for various things, but uh he can modulate his thing for various things. I'm a yeah. paid film critic. He's bisexual? <laughs> Is he? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! A thing modulation. I love him Sorry. so much in Solaris. A few years later, yeah. he would. I would nominate him for an Oscar for that performance. I I would borderline nominate him for this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a terrific. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the only thing working against him is that the film is such an ensemble. Yeah. But yeah. everything he does in this film is incredible. He's also the, he has the biggest emotional arc in the movie, and he's the griffiest character. If, I mean, if I'm going to be able to connect to any character in this movie that I don't understand, it's him. I, I um, think he's great in Dogville. Did he win a Griffey that year? He yeah, won he won, Griffey he won that a Griffey. Year. Oh. And of course, he's Daniel Faraday in Lost. My favorite character like in Lost. One of the best characters right. in Lost. And, and what has he done since? 
Well, he was in Justified, which he's fantastic in. And, and other uh, than that, he's right. done like fucking TV guest yeah. spots. He hasn't done enough. He hasn't it's, done a, a talkie since he's it's such, kind of a funny story. Su- yeah, that's true. He's such a specific actor, and yeah. I do feel like you need to find the right spot for him. Yeah. But uh, it is sad that we don't get enough JD. Maybe he doesn't want to. He strikes me as one of those guys who maybe just wants to do what he wants to do. I think right? he also might be a little difficult. I could see him being very, very exacting on He's set. He's such about a doing mannered actor. Yes. Yeah, and that can be tough if you want to like direct him. Specific- yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, another sh- small performance I wanted to point out um, before I forgot. And there's so um, many good ones. There's so many good. I mean, you know, just a million. Uh, Dennis Farina's great. Love is him. the guy yeah. who sends him on send him on the Jim. mission. But uh, Leland Orser, yeah, he's great. Yeah. As the kind of really like shell shocked pilot who yeah. talks about the plate, you know, the brought the plane. Yeah. Like that's just such a good scene. He's yeah. a, a great, uh, yeah, messed up guy. Yeah. Leland Orser. He's so you need someone to be real messed Isn't up. Isn't he the the it revealed to be the villain in the Bone Collector? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this movie was a real Bone Collector. Let me tell you. Uh, that's I why think- I wanted to join the army. <laughs> Collect some, collect some bones. Some bones. <laughs> yeah, Farina's great. Harvey Presnell, who we mentioned, who had been in Fargo a couple years earlier. He's such a great... Cranston with one arm. Cranston with one arm, one on Cranston. Uh, Giamatti, Ted Danson, as we... You know, Jane Kaczmarek had bitten it off. That's that's what was happening. Absolutely, and it took him three years to regrow it. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Fillion kills his fucking scene. Great scene. Because oh, yeah. Nathan Fillion, I was talking about this with Joanna, who... Uh, it, such a good buffoon. Yeah. And it's a great buffoon moment, even though you feel for the guy. Yeah. And he just nails it. Where yeah. it's like this could be private, right? He, he's almost exactly the same as Matt Damon, except, uh, except you know, a, a bit yeah. of a doofus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, or a bit more of a doofus. But for Castle, but for well, Firefly, and you know all that stuff. Well, I thought Castle was funnier. Yeah, to it say. is fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's objectively funnier. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, those are that's like I feel good like, cast. Those and, uh, are the guys. That the guy, guy uh, his yeah. name is Jorg Stadler, who plays Steamboat Willie. He plays the German. Oh yeah, uh, soldier. Betty Boop, what a dish! What a dish! Oh. That's a good one scene performance. A really, strong it's not one scene. He's in several scenes. It felt like such a long. I don't know. Well, right, but you know, he pops back up there. It's one sequence. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. yeah. That whole yeah, sequence yeah. is incredible. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, well, yeah. What happens? So then they just go on this journey. They go on the mission. You know, yeah. he gathers his guys. It's sort of Pilgrim's Progress. They just kind of mm-hmm. they meet different and, you, and, and yeah, they're they're journeying through. It's a really the, ingenious the, the way French to show. Theater. You know, so you have the scene with the the French people in their bombed out house and trying Which, to give their kids away. You see um, a shell shocked pilot and a bunch of airborne guys who are like really yeah, were like who, in the shit. You know, right. were dropped it yeah. all wrong and yeah. like they and were, yeah. there's that guy who had the grenade go off and he's yelling. That and, guy's really funny. Whoever that yeah, guy is, oh, yeah, he's good. Yeah. Um, so you see these kind of different pockets of the conflict. And you see you know. the men's cynicism like yeah. boiling throughout. Like yeah. the great scene where they're going through the dog tags like with utter dispassion. And then Rabizi is and like Rabizi stop. stops them. And he even stops Hanks. Yeah. Because Miller is making is to kinda in on He's the kinda too, half in on it. He's sort of smiling yeah. and nodding. Yeah. Yeah. So they just kinda go. And then they right. finally find well, people well, die the, kind of he, well, so Vin Diesel's shot yeah. by a sniper, and that's where you have Barry Pepper is really cool. Yeah, he sprinkles the, a little pepper on it. And actually, I was I was noticing the sniper at down. <laughs> if he's the pepper, is is um, Ed Burns is the salt, right? Yeah, salt, yeah, yeah. salty Ed Burns. And Vin's that steak. <laughs> um, <laughs> can I tell a Vin story quickly? Always. Um, so he, you know, Vin felt like he was fighting an uphill battle because he was so unconventional in type yeah. and sort of his uh, always mysterious ethnic background that he still has never, um, you know, made clear. Um, and, uh, he, he couldn't get cast in anything really. Um, so he, he made his own stuff and he made the short film multifacial that was about his struggles of not being easily typecastable. Spielberg saw that, loved it. I think he loves actors who are also filmmakers, which also probably appealed. Indeed. He had Burns. How does Spielberg see something like that? It just gets passed. I think, I think Spielberg is constantly being barraged with yeah. like, yeah, you should check this out. Right. Like, yeah. I would also imagine a guy like Spielberg has like. Filter people. Be like, right. hey, what what's the stuff I should actually see? Because didn't Alden Ehrenreich break because Steven Spielberg saw him at a bar mitzvah? At a, at a bar mitzvah? Yeah, 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 correct. He was in a sketch that's, video at a bar mitzvah. I did not know that. Yeah. That is yeah. crazy. That's But if I were Steven Spielberg, that's what I'd do. I would constantly just be so enamored of my power yeah. to yeah. like literally transform someone's life if I like saw... Like any kind of potential in him, I, I think. I mean, of course, he's been wrong, I guess, sure. or he's like, but he's pretty good. Uh, I think part of it's right place, right time, and part of it's like he just has a really good eye. Right, I got to pee, guys. <laughs> so he made this short. Spielberg saw it. 
Uh, right. And then cast him in this. Right. And, you know, Vin is a guy who, who is not very modest. You know, he's a very confident man in terms of yeah. his abilities. Yeah. So now he's in a fucking Steven Spielberg movie, and he's starting to get momentum because he's got the heat. He was sort of anointed, whatever. Um, so he gets cast in Reindeer Games. As the Ben Affleck part? Uh, or? No, to be one of Gary Sinise's flunkies, oh, I think. Okay. He's, like, part of the right. one of the heavies right. in the group. But like, an ensemble kind of physical presence role. Yeah. And on set, John Frankenheimer asked him to take his shirt off. Mm. And he said, I only take my shirt off for Vin Diesel movies. And, he and went, he, there was no such thing as Vin Diesel yeah, movies. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And he went, what? And he goes, I saved that for Vin Diesel movies. And they were like, what the fuck? Are-? And he stood his ground. They fired him from the movie. Wow. And then he got pitch black and he takes his fucking shirt off. Because it's a Vin Diesel movie. Yeah. Like Oof. the next year, pitch black, Iron Giant is that same year. And he took his shirt off in that. Yep. Guess- what, when he was recording, if you watch the B roll, he's shirtless <laughs> yeah, the whole time yeah, they're recording great. Iron Giant. Yeah. And then uh and then the year after that's Fast and Furious. Like just as quickly as he got fired from And he really dodged a bullet there. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's a terrible movie. But it's like he plays the titular role in an American animated classic. Wait, who do you know who got the part that he was fired from? I don't from? who gives some a shit. Random. It's not Vin Diesel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's some guy yeah. who just was beefy and took his shirt off. Yeah, there you go. You'll oh, never know that. Talking story. Reindeer's Day? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll, Reindeer's I'll, Day. I'll, yeah. Reindeer's, Reindeer's Day. Day. Isn't yeah. that amazing, though? I only take my shirt off That's for Vin Diesel movies. That's great. And he's and it, it, so sure that that would be a thing 100%. in the future. Yeah. And he was right. He was, yeah, Vin Diesel, he's, he's totally right. with confidence. And now he's Triple X coming back. Back at you. With, <sighs> who's the crazy person who's in that movie? Tony Collette. Ruby Rose. Tony Collette, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ruby Rose, yeah. But Tony Collette is like, what? I am so in it's the like bag. It's like Juliette Binoche being in... Um, in Godzilla? In, in uh, Ghost of the Machine. Or, <laughs> yeah, Ghost, Ghost, of, Ghost of the Machine. I think the, the biggest one is uh, Laura Linney in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, Out of the Shadows. Mm-hmm. Joan Allen in Death Race. Well, she directed it. I mean, it's, just, yeah, it's kind did. of like a Hitchcockian cameo. <laughs> and really. you wrote it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, Laura yeah. would dispute that, but... We haven't I even can't. discussed your directorial debut, Trolls. <laughs> My trolls? Yeah, your trolls. Did you love my trolls? Of course I loved your trolls. Oh, have you seen my trolls, Griffin? <laughs> this has been Richard's best. Please love my take. trolls. <laughs> Please. I worked so hard on my trolls. <laughs> when people hear this, it will be like, <laughs> no one will remember that that fucking movie existed. You out there in podcast land, have you seen my trolls? <laughs> my trolls is now on DVD. <laughs> Probably is. <laughs> <laughs> you getting that? You getting that uh, EPK ready for your trolls? My, yeah, I am. Anyway. Uh, one million comedy points. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite thing about your trolls? My trolls? Oh, <laughs> there's just so much. Um, you know, I just love that they all sound like Anna Kendrick. Yeah, so definitely, definitely. The most, the best sound in nature. That that scrappy little nobody. Uh, Anna K. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> so there's the scene where they 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 Giovanni dies while they're trying to take out a machine gun and then uh, they they and the problem with that is the that German guy. they could have gone around right. But right. then Hanks is yeah. like, well, then we're just going to leave this for someone else. To, right. You know, so we got to do it and that sort of duty thing and and that really frustrates them and it's like and that's when that's when Burns they, freaks out. Uh, Ryman. Yeah, and then Hanks is like. How much is a pool up to? Right. And then he tells them that he's from Pennsylvania. Of course, he could only be from Pennsylvania. Little, little because fictional it's, town in Pennsylvania. It's mid Atlantic. You know, it doesn't have Absolutely. too much right. of an identity right. unless he's like, it was, it's not from coal country. It's just sort of like. Yeah. But then, but we never get to the bottom of where Ed Burns' character is from. Yeah. No, it's a mystery. It's a total mystery. Yeah. Uh, is it, and then does he start <laughs> Southern crying? California? He strikes me as a Madison guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start, oh, yeah, totally. Oh, this is New England. Son of intellectuals. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Does he start crying after he gives that speech? Like the kind the Hank's breakdown scene where he like privately goes off and starts crying. I can't remember if it's I right before or right, right after. Before. I think it's right before. And then he kind of gets snaps out himself. of himself. Yeah. yeah. But that's his his So yeah, so, that's so his leadership R- R- Rabizi dies there, right? mm-hmm. and then he just like goes over the hill and breaks down, I think. But but or it's then like, they get the gun. No, no, they, Rabisi dies right, and then they're gonna kill the German and Jeremy Davis is uh, up him, he uh, prevails on them to be moral and to, you know, not shoot a prisoner of war, so they send him marching off, uh, supposedly towards the Allies, right. but of course he gets picked up by the Germans again. Right. And I think, yeah, the, I think that's he, that's when all that's happening. That's yeah. when Ed, Ed Burns freaks out and Tom Sizemore points a gun at him. And, and, and once again, to his credit, Tom Hanks has, like, three separate Oscar monologues in this movie. Mm-hmm. Like, he has three yeah, scenes absolutely. that feel like they're tailor-made, and he doesn't play any of them he like He was Oscar nominated scenes. for it, right? He was. He, yeah, was. he, he yeah. lost to Nicholson. Right. For as good as it gets. No, no that was the no, year, before. year before. He lost oh, to Oh, you're Benini. right. He lost to Benini. Oh, 
Oh. He lost to Benini. Uh, so, you know, the year the, oh. the nominees that year. Benini literally climbed over his chair. Yeah, for the listener at home, Ben is currently standing on top of the table. Yeah. <laughs> Hanks was Hanks was never going to win. He had two Oscars, yeah. uh, you know, and only a few an, years and earlier. It's, an it's a more movie. subdued role. It's an un- but the yeah. other nominees were Ian McKellen in Gods and Monsters, which is a great performance. Should have won. Nick Nolte in Affliction, which is a really good underrated performance, and uh Edward Norton in American History X. Which is not well, a movie I'm fond of, but he is he's quite good in it. Yeah. Who do you, you guys, who do you pick in that? Yeah. McKellen, probably. McKellen, right? I think I would, yeah. Joseph Fiennes. <laughs> 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 who would you pick, Richie? Um, I would pick, I would think I would go with McKellen as well. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think of like. Remember when Bill Condon made movies like that? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Billy. Yeah. yeah. And now he's, what, he's doing Beauty and the Beauty Goddamn Beast. Beauty and yeah. the Beast. That oh. looks like It's going to be out shit. like next week when this yeah, happens. Is that true? Is it that soon? <laughs> no, it's in March, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, this will be coming out in February, yeah, I think, so. early February. I mean, yeah. some great male performances, uh, lead male performances that year, Jim Carrey in The Truman Show. Correct. Oh, uh, and he famously wasn't nominated. Was nominated. He won the Golden Globe and said, you know what this means? I'm a shoe-in for the Blockbuster Award. Yeah, Remember that? that was funny. During his speech. Uh, Dave Foley in A Bug's Life. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, George Clooney in Out of Sight. Uh, Jeff Bridges oh. in Big Lebowski. Jason Schwartzman in Rushmore. Taylor Leone in Deep Impact. <laughs> I mean, Depp in Fear and Loathing, if that's your speed. Uh, you got John that's Travolta in way. Primary Colors. Uh, a lot of lot of great movies yeah. in 1998. Vanessa Redgrave in Deep Impact. <laughs> Keep going. John Favreau. John Favreau. <laughs> Laura Ines. Is that how you say it? I, I don't actually know how you say that woman's Lily last name. Lily yeah. mm. Chris Klein would be supporting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, what a movie. Uh... Oh, no, that's 99, right? Election's 99. I was going to say Broderick, but that's the following year. Uh, election is 99, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quite a year. So um, then they finally arrive, right, at, uh, in their, at Ramel. Ramel, Ramel. Which is right. a made-up town uh, yeah. in France. Bombed to shit. Bombed to shit. It's supposed to be like Dovo or someone like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, they meet Ryan and some other this kind of ragtag cannon fodder. <laughs> and they're, they're guarding a bridge because during that stage of the conflict, Bridges were really important because if you didn't have bridges, you couldn't get tanks across. And it was all about the tanks, across. baby. Yeah. 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 So, so they so, decide to have this kind of last Alamo. Right. Because Ryan's Fuck like, I'm, I'm not getting. Yeah. I'm not being like airlifted out of here. Are you crazy? Like I'm. I'm he has in a great war. scene where he goes and hides and breaks down too. Damon, uh, Matt really Damon, good terrific. Oh, what am I talking about? He's the cutest boy in the movie, of course. <sighs> boy, is he cute? What's he has the me? big monologue about. Uh, uh, when they all humiliated, sexually humiliated some woman in a barn. <laughs> and oh god, that's right. But that's like, don't do it. You're a young man. Oh, a, yeah. a well delivered monologue. Yeah. A, a good, a scene. very Damon kind of like boyish, but decent. I don't know. I mean, and that's a scene I feel like a lot of actors uh, don't pull off. On screen oh, yeah. laughing sure. is underrated as a hard thing very, to do. Very, very good point. And it's not a particularly funny story. No, and no. that's and I but like he that he sells it. He and sells that it's of, that yeah. funny to him. I yeah. like yeah. that Hanks uh, that Miller is kind of like sort of giving him the like yeah you know like the sort of half smile yeah. just to be like all right I'm listening to you. I mean yeah. this isn't my favorite story, but and then when yeah. he says what about those garden gloves and Hanks just goes no. Yeah, that's for me. This is the very curt no, and then the pause before that's just for me. That's yeah. that's a really well written scene. And the and then that that. Then it, I think it goes from there to them to the other guys listening to Edith Piaf on the Victrola or whatever that is, yeah. the gramophone. Um, Burns sung the, the and, bra story. Yeah. yeah, and then the tension just is coiling and coiling and mm. coiling because you know it's coming, you know it's coming. And I just think that it's so well built, and you have this feeling of dread mm-hmm. because they're having this moment of kind of contemplative peace and quiet, you know, uh, And then you, but you know that the thing is coming. And it, yes. it's a really well done bit of tension, I well, think. And as Me a too. storytelling move, it's like, the whole movie is them trying to find the guy. They find the guy. He goes, I'm not leaving. And yeah. now the movie goes, hey, guess what? Surprise. Here's another hour. Yeah. The mission is now to keep the guy alive because right. he's not coming with us. Yeah. Right. So, so Hanks, we have to Hanks keep has him. to bond yeah. him basically to right. his side. Uh, yeah, he says that. He's like, yeah, yeah he's yeah, like, yeah, you're not yeah. leaving me. Yeah. Where am I going to be? And he goes within 20, 20 yeah. feet of me at all right. times. So, yeah. you know, the D-Day sequence obviously is like utterly realistic and devoted to realism. This is more action movie. of an action movie yeah. war set piece. It like throws a little realism out the window a little bit. They have these you know, little sticky bombs with the socks. Although I think those, those are real. Were real. Yeah. I just think like, you know, it's one of those things where like D-Day veterans saw this movie and a lot of them said like, you know, it was tremendously accurately portrayed the landings. Whereas this stuff is more like, yeah, military tactics, quote unquote, yeah. right. maybe being ignored. But uh, it's a tr- terrific. But it's a siege sequence. thing and they have to kind of bottleneck them. And it's a whole. Yeah. Um, but it's so well done and terrifying. 
Goldberg gets a, a knife very, very slowly driven into his While heart. While saying, like, no, 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 no. Which like, I'd say is the up. worst yeah. speed a knife could be pushed into your heart is slow. And yeah. this, this is where Upham has, Jeremy Davis has his big uh, sort of, I don't know. I mean, it's where Steamboat Willie, the German. Well, boy, and, and, which is a bit of a back. contrivance, I think, you know, given the chaos of this whole. I would say it's, would... it's the one cheesy twist of the movie. Yeah. I, I'd pick yeah. one other moment. I think there's one moment where Spielberg really Spielbergs it. Okay. I think it's the conversation with old Damon and his wife. Oh. I, I think gilds the lily a little what, too do you, hard. Do you like the bookend at all? Or do you think I should... like the bookend. I think that should be like two lines of dialogue. But he's like, am I a good man? And, she's, yeah, and I think yeah. she says way too much. Yeah. I think it's really yeah. overwritten. Okay. It is. Because at that bit. point, they, we've already won. We You've got us. Yeah. We're, we're on your side, yeah. you know? Yeah. It just it feels a little indulgent. Yeah, that's the one moment where I felt like Spielberg was really playing the strings. You know, and I think that that is something that has animated his career for a long, long time. Is that he and he can't he has a hard time resisting that, and he has all these incredible serious impulses that grew as a filmmaker as he went on. But there's still that kind of schmaltzy thing that, it, Which, that, that uh, you know, I love some good schmaltz when it's appropriate. I think where it often fails him specifically at endings. I well, think it, ending, endings are endings. exactly the problem. I mean, you look at something like AI, yeah. which I think is an ex- is a really profound My and really Spielberg beautiful movie. movie. Your number but one it, favorite of all, Absolutely. but it yeah, should, with, with, but it should that. end with him at the bottom of the ocean. I Correct. disagree. And I will defend it very stringently next week. I think the end okay. of the AI is one of the greatest pieces of science fiction ever written. I mean, Love I, it. I, I see both sides. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I'm, I, I do agree that as like filmmaking or as traditional yeah. storytelling, that ending is tough to take. Lincoln could have ended before it ends. Oh, that's the Lincoln's, worst Lincoln's thing about Lincoln. That's the worst. Th- I it mean, just keeps going, and you're like, he, all right. You know, Bridge of Spies has it. You know, there's a lot of things. Bridge where of Spies has three endings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah. why'd you tack yeah. on this extra five yeah. minutes? We get it. It should and end with him asleep in the bed. Yeah. He's just a little. Yeah. He's getting a little too grandfatherly, and he's like, well, just in case you didn't understand. But he wants to soothe you. Mm-hmm. That's the thing is he and wants everyone that. to leave feeling you know. You know Minority you Report know. as well has uh, yeah has a bunch of endings there. He he always has multiple endings. Great movie. Yeah. Uh, he has multiple endings always, multiple resolutions. Yeah. And then it always just feels like at the end of the ride, he's unwilling to take his foot off the gas. Maybe yeah. it's like it's a, his encore. You know, like yeah. if it was a band. <laughs> you know, like, he's oh, got to You want a little, one, you want one more? Yeah, yeah exactly. Go. Maybe he should put it after the credits, Marvel style. You know, <laughs> that's exactly right. He, yeah. He's only made one perfect movie, and it's called The Terminal, and you wrote it. Well, that's, from that's me, why sick. it's perfect, because I was like, it no, was there on endings, the page. Dude. That's the thing. It was you on were, the page. No ending. <laughs> no beginning, no ending, no, no middle. Nope. <laughs> nope. I mean, structurally, it's the perfect movie. It's wild. You yeah, were just sitting yeah. there at your screen, and you were like, "I just need one line. I need her to say something. Get away from me. I'm sick." Yeah. That's, that's yeah, yeah, something yeah. she screams early in that. Movie. We'll get to the terminal. We'll you, oh, we'll get there. Peaks and, and we, valleys, guys. and we won't be able to leave. We'll be stuck there forever. Yeah, you guys know I was born in Krakowia, right? <laughs> That's Hanks' number one worst performance with a bullet. Right? A what the hell is that movie? Horrible performance. I mean, you'll talk about it, but what is that movie? It's one of those I think things... it was just because Steven Spielberg wanted to build an airport terminal. He was like, that wouldn't, might that, be be, true. wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, my, with, and yeah. It's, uh, but it's one of those things. It's kind of like, you know, we just we were talking about Lion, which at this point has been out for a while. But, you know, where someone tells you the story and you're like, wow, what a holy shit story. Yeah. Like, how could that not be a good movie? Like, that'll be great. And we'll have all the little airport guys. Like, we'll have a little ensemble. Yeah. It'll be funny. I heard him explain it once, but we'll save that for the Terminal episode. I heard sure. him explain in retrospect why he did it. Um, yeah. Like we've said before, he's he's good at accounting for his failures. Spielberg. Yeah. yeah. He's not like George Lucas, who people are like, you know, not everyone likes the Phantom Menace. He's like, no, everyone likes it. <laughs> you know, right? yeah, people who don't like it are stupid. Um, this uh, he also knows when when he hits it out of the ballpark. Like he's not arrogant, but I I think if you ask him, he's like, that's Empire Ryan, pretty fucking good movie, right? That one, that one, it's pretty good. What are what are some? I'm trying to think of some. Of, it's the guy who blows up the sticky bomb blow up. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Barry Pepper's death is really uh, arresting. The uh, the tank going. Tank. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there are just so many bits in this this kind of siege sequence that are just so well done, and it's like paying attention to all these details mm-hmm. and motion, and you know. And you, I think, a really important thing that is not true of a lot of big kind of action scenes like this is that you really have a good sort of sense of the space, yeah. like the spatial awareness of of where everyone is and mm-hmm. what's going on. I think is is as clear as it can. Agreed. Be. Totally. Agreed. Absolutely you know? true. You you get. And it's a it's a complicated siege that's happening here, and you get you yeah. get it. The stakes of it are laid out geographically very well. Uh, it's an uh, excellent movie. I'll never watch it again as long as mm-hmm. I live. I'm mm-hmm. probably going to watch it again probably like a year or two from now. Like I I, feel, I just come back to it every so often. I own it. Uh, 
great. Yeah, and the end, I mean, you know, I remember when I first saw it being just like, wait, I can't believe that after all that, they kill Captain Miller. Sure. You know, when he has that great earnness. Earnness. You know. Fucking Hanks, man. Yeah. Hanks. Yeah. Hanks. A lot of actors would, would, would botch that line or try yeah. to sell it too hard. He earned this. That's what makes him a movie star is he knows how to do the throwaway stuff like that. God, this yeah. movie's so corny, and but it's so perfectly wonderful. It's, it's 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 the yeah, it's the kind of like apex of this kind of great generation. Yes, you know, although which is why but I think it, it doesn't shy, sometimes. but it doesn't shy away from the, from the sort brutality. Of, yeah, right. which I think is what makes it uh, art. Yes, you know? I agree. Yeah. I mean, and I th- I do think that's why this movie gets dismissed because it's seen as this like almost jingoistic greatest generation. Like, oh boy, mm. like you know, that's yeah. when men were men and. You know, courage was real, or I don't know, but it's, it's, uh, go ahead. It's no, appropriate. I mean, maybe it's just because I hadn't seen it until now, and I've been able to, like, I remember when the movie came out, I remember the immediate reaction, I remember the backlash, the backlash to the backlash, how it's aged, all of this. But I, watching it last night, found it a lot more restrained than I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think people oh, yeah. make too much of a meal out of the Spielberg tendencies in the movie, you know? Yeah. No, I agree. This is a very tough movie to watch. It is not gauzy. No. At all. And it's it's got, like, a real kind of humanist message to it. Yes. But but it's buried in a lot of shit. Like, it doesn't, it's not, it, that does not, uh you know, transcend everything else the film is saying. It doesn't overwhelm it. Uh, can we talk about something? I, I think we just need to address it that I think all three of us are going to agree is a non-issue. Sure. But it's a thing that people talk about in relation to this movie, and I had heard about it before seeing it. What? Mm. The, the trick with the... Uh, sort of misdirect of making you think it's probably Hanks at the beginning of the film. Oh, because it goes into his eyes. Yeah, I know yeah. people who, like, are furious about that. Who do you know And say that's, like, very dishonest this? filmmaking. But but it's, like... No, it's not. It's not. It's just a misdirect. And it, he, doesn't, he doesn't tell you it's fucking Hanks. He just, like, makes you... You you assume that. You put that together in your head. They don't cut from the old guy's eyes to Hanks' eyes. Interesting. I never assumed that. Uh, I don't know. Really? Yeah. yeah Who do was, you think it was at the beginning? They zoom in on his. Right. Really? Okay. They zoom in on, in on his eye, and then it, the next shot is the helmet lifting. Yeah. The, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, who Who do you know who's so worked up about this? They I've names. heard people say that. I can't remember because I hadn't seen it, and I sure. was like, you know, it was an ending to a movie I hadn't watched the beginning of. You know, I've been to that graveyard in uh, Normandy. Mm. Uh, I've always wanted I, to go. Uh, yeah, when I moved to Britain, like the first vacation we went oh, on you was in to Britain. No- <laughs> Humble brand. Uh, was we first vacation we went on was to Normandy, and we went to all the beaches, which are crazy yeah. to visit. I'm sure. Uh, and uh, do some people the- like go swimming there? Or <laughs> no, like, it, no, well, it's all a memorial. They must because, like, I remember we, we were <laughs> we were there. I think in like February or something. So it was Hot like very plan. bleak and gray, and yeah. you know, dramatic. and I feel like it always is. You know? I, it must like, be. I'm right? sure there are sunny days in my but, head. That's what it yeah, looks like. Yeah. Uh, but that graveyard is staggering. It yeah. is staggering to see it. Like the amount of graves. Like I yeah. mean, it's like Arlington or whatever. But Arlington is a military graveyard. So it's many. You know, but like this thing where you're just seeing like a battle basically represented in dead. It's crazy. It's thousands, right? Yeah. It's crazy. That final morph effect is incredible too. When it morphs from Damon's face oh, to yeah. the older actor, mm-hmm. oh, it's yeah. amazing mm-hmm. how well the older, done it is. The older yeah. actor is called, uh, what's his name? And, then, like, uh, and, then, Harrison Young. and then Black or White starts yes. playing. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. just going to say, it's like a counterpoint. <laughs> yeah. That's like the only good <laughs> morph in history. Yeah. Well, yeah. Titanic's yeah. got some decent morphs. Not at the same level of like. Well, there's the eye. Oh, the Matrix movies have a really fun morph. Yeah. Yeah, and X Men has is. a good morph. Mm-hmm. Yeah. X Men, yeah. the team, has a good morph. Uh, all right, so um, we should mention that this film lost uh, Best Picture to Shakespeare in Love and was uh, seen as a surprising upset. Uh, I won yeah. the Oscar pool at the party that year. Yeah, we talked about around this Around grown-ups because once, yeah. I picked Shakespeare in Love because I had seen it. Mm-hmm. Well, you made the right choice. Yeah. And at uh, the time, I felt very conflicted because I loved both movies. I adore both movies. I don't know. Don't make me pick. I love them both. I remember I, was, is I also love The Thin Red Line. Charming. Nature yeah, and Love is great, incredible. And I think it's one of the. I think I was very comedies. happy that um, that who's he, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow won, mm-hmm. and I, w- I then I, w- I wanted Saving Private Ryan to win Best Picture, so I was a little disappointed. But like, but Spielberg. But got I remember best at the time, you know, going to school the next day and people being like, nah, 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 and I was like, no, I mean Shakespeare and Love's great, just because it's you know, right. You know, I was I've always stuck up for it. Shakespeare and Love mm-hmm. because I feel like it gets unfairly targeted. I mean, it's a goddamn Tom Stoppard script. It's really it's, good. It's yeah. the best. Yeah, and uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, also I guess it's just acquired that reputation as like the ultimate like. Harvey Weinstein like guerrilla campaign. Well, to, like, the, the lore the... is that that was what really that was yes, like the, right. the most you know. But the he, one that did how it. did he sink Saving Private Ryan? Because it's it is true that Saving Private Ryan almost seemed. Was it just like that the Oscar voters had just you know given Schindler's List Best Picture a few years ago, so they were like 
It's okay. Think, we can miss this one, you right? You have to think, especially because it's like, I mean, this is what this is five years after Schindler's List, but yes. there's only three, two movies in between. It's Spielberg movies, yeah. 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 You know? So it's like, that's pretty close to that's like. That's true. Then stop but, giving I mean, it about too, the biggest but, movie yeah. of the year and like probably one close. of the most biggest received yeah. and like just a huge you know it's like it should be Oscar catnip and yeah. and one could imagine so this was these were the days I believe just just kind of pre screeners you know so you voters would actually have to go yeah to a theater in L A or New York and see the thing and you know a lot of these people are old you, you know. Do you want to go see a three-hour war film, or do you want to go see a two-hour thing that's, like, nice and a romance? Delightful. Like, you know, maybe that had some effect. But I'll actually say, Harvey was one of the guys who really made screeners a thing. And sure, I right. think this might have been one of the years, actually. So he would be, he would be saying, the counter work DVDs for, existed at that point? It was VHS. They'd VHS. send VHS screeners okay, to everybody. So maybe I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, no, seriously. It was VHS screeners. And the big thing was, I, I think, Ryan the thing that worked in his favor. Yeah. yeah. Shakespeare in Love is like a perfect VHS movie. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of that that still happens now where, you know, and I know that a lot of the studios are trying to get people to actually go see them in the theater. So they kind of add, do, do added value with Q&As and all this shit. Yeah. Um, it's still not. People would still rather get the DVDs and watch at home. You know? uh, grown ups don't go see movies. That's the great tragedy of the American yeah. Yeah. Uh, cinematic landscape. Yeah. Is that, and it really yeah. affects things. I mean, you know, I yeah. think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad it didn't, but like had... The Revenant, been, everyone Oof. had seen it in a theater because it's so cinematic, whatever. Like they, yeah. that probably would have beat Spotlight, which plays beautifully on the screener. Yeah. Um, no. But I will never forget um, Harrison Ford, who presented Best Picture that year. Shakespeare in Love, because <laughs> they so obviously thought you know it would be oh Harrison gets to give Stevie uh, his, yeah. another and Oscar. then he had to, yeah gave it I mean, to John Madden uh, or no, no the producers Harvey the producer, Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein yeah, among yeah. them, uh, and that was the and, year they and were Ed like. Right, and there were like six producers for Shakespeare in Love, and that was when the Oscars changed the producer rules, so like you could only have so many nominated, right. which right. is still true. Um, box office game, guys. Yeah. So yeah. this, I know, because uh, I ninety eight was maybe like the peak of my box office tracking obsession. You know, because sure. I've been in a couple years, and this is when I really started to get serious. So I know that the three highest grossing films of nineteen ninety eight all came out in the same month. Interesting. So I assume that I can guess three out of the five. Sight unseen, without any hints. I don't know in the places. But I would assume all three of the top grossing films in 1998 are in the five. Saving Private Ryan, obviously, is number one the week it comes out. Um, yes, Saving Private Ryan opens number one. This is July 24th, 1998, with $30 million uh, as its opening weekend. It eventually grosses 216 Insane. Uh, so that's a huge multiplier and um, uh, makes $480 million worldwide. Do you think that these days... It dropped like 20% every week for like three months. Would this movie come out in the summer? No, absolutely no, not. It would be a fall, not. right? There's no way this or movie... Or spring. Well, look, American Sniper came out in January. I mean, you, know you know what? what? I, it would be like Hacks. a Christmas Day release and then yeah. a wide release in January. Yes, 100%. Hacksaw yeah. Ridge was September, right? That's No, what? it came out... It was this, October. It came out in November. No, it was November. Oh, Jesus, what's the matter? Not really. Uh, yeah, a God, couple weeks ago. Is, yeah, Stretch I mean it's me. you know, um, but yeah, I just that's it's just so surprising that that third weekend in in July that's a big weekend for and that movies. was like a big summer yeah. blockbuster. And you think of a movie that's this difficult in so many ways and, and R rated and yeah. really R rated. You yeah. know, like mm -hmm. it's just surprising. But but it was I remember like all the boys in my grade went to go see it because it was like their parents mm -hmm. were like this is important. You know? Yeah, for sure. And they were excited to go see it. Um, okay, so the other two highest grossing films no, in no. 1998. Well, okay, fine. You want to show off? I, right, I want to show off. Armageddon has to still be in the top five. It is. Number five with 11 million, it's made 149. And Something About Mary has to yeah. still be in Number the top four, five. Number right? four, okay. 12 million, 40 million dollars. So it's going to have a long life. It's, it's, uh, it famously only... doesn't hit number one until week eight. Yeah, that one just sticks around. That, that's not a thing that happens anymore. It was an amazing yeah. box office round. Yeah. yeah. But number two is one of my favorite movies of 1998 that I watched over and over and over and over again as a child. I own it on VHS. I still love it. It's great. It's a fun, rip-snorting action adventure starring some great actors. It's sexy. It's, I don't know, it's the best. Uh, Zorro? Yeah. Oh, that's a great movie. The Mask of Zorro. That's a great. That was that I, movie is yeah. fucking great. I remember when that was movie was being reviewed when it was about to come out, and all the reviews were like, "It's surprisingly it's good. good. It's yeah. good." And they I got made so a excited. Zorro movie, took my family and it's to good. see it. And we all loved it. We were like, "What fun that was!" You mm -hmm. know, Anthony Hopkins, Antonio yeah. Banderas, yeah. And Catherine Zeta-Jones, and Ar. Uh, do you know what part of your hint gave it away from me? What? Rip snorting. Rip snorting. It's a mm. rip snorting adventure. When you hear rip snorting, one word comes to mind. Zorro! When I hear rip snorting, I say, Mr. Taylor. <laughs>
<laughs> or I mean, it would have been better if it was Rip Torn, but whatever. We can edit that in post. <laughs> yeah, do it in post. Yeah. Yeah. Rip Taylor. I mean, that's an old. No, that's he, fine. He's long dead. That's fine. 50 comedy points. Number three was an action film, uh, a sequel uh, in a series. It's like not even the second sequel. It's a, it's a sequel in a long running action series. Lethal that, Weapon 4? Correct. That does not continue. This is the end of it. Yeah. I told you, 98 was my, was my Ballywick, baby. Let's, let's see if we can just go to knock any downs quickly. Bottom five. What's number six? Uh, a hilarious family comedy that I've seen a billion times as well. Uh, Are you being sarcastic about the hilarious part? Yes, although certainly when I was 12, I thought it was hilarious. Jungle to Jungle? No. Is it's it a Disney guess. picture? Uh, I actually have no idea. It's live action. It is, although there is some some animated fun happening to uh, spice up the comedy. I, I that, That's sort of, that's sort of a, a confusing clue. That's a Mr. X? <laughs> God. I mean, if I say, all right, it's got talking animals in it. Oh, Dr. Way. Doolittle. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie Murphy is Dr. Doolittle. Which also was humongous. was like the fifth highest grossing film of the year. Huge. Yeah, the top ten for 98 is insane. Million. Waterboy's number four. <laughs> Dr. Doolittle's number five. The Water No, no. Boy? Bugs Life is four. Waterboy oh, is right. five. Dr. Doolittle six. Ugh. Rush Hour, go. Deep Impact, Godzilla, Patch Adams. Those are your big movies. That's an insane top ten. We never, ever will see a top ten <laughs> that like that is, ever again. That no, accurate. that's wild. People... Patch goddamn Adams. I mean, like... <laughs> Coming in at ten. <laughs> wow. That movie would make like fifteen million dollars. Yeah, it would and, go st- almost yeah. straight to VOD. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Patch Adams outgrossed Lethal Weapon Four. It did, <laughs> and is objectively terrible, and was considered so at the time. I remember, yes. like, people weren't like, people oh, were Patch actively Adams. Actively angry at that movie. <laughs> yeah. I remember like, there was an SNL sketch like the week after Patch Adams came out. That was the cold open. Was two guys at a bar talking about the state of America, and Will Ferrell was one of them. And it was in the middle of all the like Clinton Whitewater stuff. Uh-huh. And he was just complaining about everything. And he goes, I mean, Patch Adams is the number one movie in America, <laughs> goddammit. That thing looks awful. Like, it was yeah. immediately People. a punchline of, like, how has this happened? Especially because it was, it was Williams' follow-up to winning an Oscar. Yeah. And no, oh, it was like, oh, now he's, like, serious. But, all, you know, you know. So don't you know well, we don't want you to yeah. do this? I guess he had done What Dreams May Come To, or that was oh, yeah. on his uh, way. That's 98, I think, yeah. So Same he year. was, yeah. yeah. Um, Bad year for... Yeah, okay, it's 97. Okay. No, no, it's 98. Six um, is Dr. Doolittle. Seven? Seven is a teen movie that I saw in theaters with some teens in it. It's a dark teen movie. Is it a horror picture? Mm, I'd call it more of a thriller. Oh. It's not Cruel Intention. No, which I also Disturbing saw. Behavior? Yeah. Oh, good one, Richard. You nailed Sorry, it. I didn't mean to uh, no, intrude no, no, on no. the No, I was not going to get that. Good call. No. Uh, David, David, directed Disturbing? by David Nutter, who had been directed a lot of X-Files episodes. Right? And now directs, like, Game of Thrones. I was going to say, remains a good TV yeah. director. Yeah. Not but so much. Th- that was, I think, his first film, and I don't know if he's done one since. Disturbing behavior. Nick so Stahl. K- Katie Holmes, Nick Stahl, uh, James Marsden, James right? James Marsden, yeah. The great James Marsden. Number mm-hmm. eight? Number eight is a spoof movie that is bad uh, by, I believe, Abrahams of the Abraham Zucker Abrahams. Jane Austen's Mafia? Oh, uh, that I remember in the trailer it had us say a little my little friend joke. Yes, it did. And then it was like a, a little person. Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> oh no! I, I think mean, he comes out from underneath a wedding dress. Eighteen years ago, I was like, you're was, gonna. It, it was yeah. a dick joke, right? No, no, <laughs> no, no. I think he literally comes out from the underside of a wedding dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that opened to six million dollars. Uh, next is a movie that you fucking love. Small sold. <laughs> Is that Joe Johnson? Uh, no, Joe it's Joe Dante. Dante. Joe Dante. My guy. Excuse me. Me and Griffin are like that annoying couple who play charades at this point. <laughs> where I'm like, the next movie is a French crawler. And he's like, small soldiers. <laughs> we just have some made up language. Is Tommy Lee Jones a voice in small soldiers? Yes. Yeah, he's the uh, major chip hazard. And who are the kid? The, who plays the kids? Gregory Smith. Oh, it is Gregory Dunst. Smith. I thought that. And That's Chris right. Yeah. Dunst, old Kiki. Kiki. That's a and uh, Phil Hartman's in that movie. It was his last movie. Am I yes, right? Yes, uh, Bill Nunn. Bill Nunn. Uh, Anne Madison, uh, and then also all the Gorgonites, other than Franklin Jella, plays uh, uh, Archer Lee. The Gorgonites are uh, the Spinal Tap guys, mm. and other than Tommy Lee Jones, all the Commando Elite are the Dirty Dozen. Oh, that's it's it's really um, quite a bizarre little movie. Gregory Smith, by the way, who follows me on Twitter. What's he up to these days, Greggy? I loved Everwood. I don't know. I well, love he small did small soldiers. Well, he did Rookie Blue for years in oh, yeah. the Canadian show that aired in the summer. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Missy yeah. Peregrine. Missy Peregrine's in that one, yeah. And his brother, um, Douglas Smith, I believe his name is, mm. was on Big Love. He was the oldest son. Oh, okay. yeah. And their father, Agent Smith, of course, is David's <laughs> best impression. That's exactly right. Yeah. David? Uh, 
What? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Small Soldiers 9. Number 10 is a movie that Disney will soon remake, just like everything else. Song of the South. Mulan. <laughs> You got me right between the ribs. It's Mulan, right? Uh, yes, Mulan. Are they actually are doing that? They announced yeah. that, right? Yeah. But then there's another Sony's studio also that's doing. doing yeah, but uh, yeah. Th- that Sony project seems like something that's never going to happen, right? That yeah. seems. I like feel like a... that's just them pissing in Disney's cornflakes yeah. a little bit. Like, that's that's an yeah. Andy Serkis Jungle Book movie that's not supposed to come out for another two years. Right. Oh boy, God, uh, one can only imagine uh, what that's going to look like. Then you got yeah. Yeah, some other movies, Madeline. Everest, yeah, Madeline fucking rules. Everest, the IMAX experience, uh, the Truman Show is still hanging around, as is the X-Files and Fight the Titanic. Future. Titanic Titanic's still, still in there. Geez. Actually grew by 10% this Titanic weekend. Titanic is still goddamn in there. $593 million it's Holy made cow. in its 32nd week in the box office. So, it's wait, number 13. In the Titanic episode, you said that the first movie to, to, to pose it from number one was... Lost in Space. Lost in Space. Which was in March. But what about Man in the April. Iron Mask? Did that premiere at number two? Yes. Okay. Yes. But, and the That's crazy thing was that Leo was the star. And they yeah. thought yeah. he was going to dethrone himself, and instead right. it was like Man in the Iron Mask opened to 24 right. or something. It was like a million below Titanic. Okay. That way. Yeah, that was March 15th. Indeed, it wow. opened only $300,000 below. 17.2. Were these 17.5. like iconic times, or did they just seem iconic to me because I lived through them? You know what I mean? Like, I mean it's just I crazy that all way. these movies were in the theater at one time, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, because they're, the, they're our movies, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, I know. A- April 3rd is uh, yeah. when Lost in Space... Finally claims the throne. I mean, that's why we started this podcast, because I, like, need to talk to other people who view these times as iconic. Right, yeah. No, yeah, exactly. right, right, right. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. That's why we play the box office game, because we go, like, can you believe it? Dr. Doolittle and Small Soldiers <laughs> my, taking up screens at the same time. Um, in the the house in Rhode Island where I spent summers as a kid, my, we used to have to call the movie theater to get show times, and it was just, like, a repeating Oh, yeah, thing, me too. You know? I used to do that, too. And so we'd write, you know, the times down in a notebook, and we still have a lot of the notebooks, <gasps> and I'll flip through, and it's, like, my handwriting from, like, 13, oh. and it's, like, it's like all those movies were in the theater. It's, like, Waterworld and whatever else. You know, it's just, yeah. it's so crazy, but, no. Bears anyway. we could fucking live yeah. then. Well, now the world's over, so. Well, yeah. maybe, you know, wait, is this going to air post-inauguration? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is coming oh, out. So this is coming February. out early February. So no one's yeah. ever going to hear it. Yeah, that's correct. Oh, that's not sad. impossible. But you yeah. know what? We had a good time recording. Hey, it. yep. Yeah, we had a fun time. Richard, always the best. Thanks for having me again, guys. It's fun. What a pleasure. What a treat. Richard. Yeah. It's been terrific. Think of an Ang Lee movie you liked. Should I join the military? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> you know the Ang Lee movie I, I, I think would be interesting to talk about because it's just such a weird movie is Woodstock. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. I've never seen it. Yeah, with its weird gay themes. and mm. yeah. We've been talking a lot about Dune Angley. We'll see. We'll see. All right, all right. All right. It's been, it's been, Have it's you been guys, around. Though. You've both seen Billy Lynn? Or? I haven't taken the walk yet, no. Oh, I took I took that long halftime walk. She baby. real bad. She real bad. <sighs> Another Vin Diesel war movie. Yeah, and he's not going to. Mm. I think he's fine. Oh, don't say that. That hurts me. I had heard Oscar buzz, but anyway. No one's getting Oscars for that one. No. No. But... I think Garrett Hedlund's pretty good, though. Richard's getting yeah. an Oscar for best guest on this episode. Yay. Thank you, guys. It's funny that the Oscars every year try to give out an award for best guest on Blank Check Saving Private Ryan episode. <laughs> and every year there's no contenders yeah. until now. Yeah. Fucking Christoph Waltz keeps winning. <laughs> for God, the same role. I'd love to have him on this podcast. He'd be a great guest. I interviewed him um, once. He was so scary. Yeah. Next week, AI with Christoph Waltz. Yep, exactly. It's about the robot. <laughs> That is the next one, right? Yep, that's right. Crazy. Spielberg takes some br- takes another break and uh, punches up a Stanley Kubrick script. <laughs> <laughs> like we all do when we take a vacation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I just love thinking about those two faxing each other. You know, they used to fax each other all the time. Oh, really? That was like their thing. You know, Kubrick's like ensconced in his British mansion and like, you know, he would just like write Spielberg a fax, you know, weird Kubrick thoughts. I'm going to go to Tennessee for the holidays and uh, take a pass at Napoleon. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, I got to do punch up on that Solaris Re- remastering. Uh, thank you for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, uh, tell, tell friends. Uh, yeah, right? That's all the stuff to say. Benny? Ben? Yeah. <laughs> I always love trying to get Ben's attention at the end when he's obviously stopped listening an hour ago. Any final thoughts? Wow. It's, no. like, it's like the calm after you just uh, fade the, the episode out there. <laughs> no final thoughts whatsoever? No, he's got none. Ah, I don't know, man. Yeah.
Okay. Cool. Oh yeah. Hey, you know what? All right. Fine. Uh, yeah. I, I got something. I got something. In okay. Here. Oh whoa. So I still believe in this our country, even though it's the world is gonna probably end soon. But also, you know, we can't give up. That's it. Thank you, Benny. Put some positivity out there. Thanks, we need it. We need, we need it. every cool. bit of positivity we can get. And I'm sorry for whatever the fuck is happening in America right now as this podcast drops. I'm sure it's a pretty weird. Yeah, and I'm sure we're not enjoying it either. Probably not. Um, but thank you for listening. Thank you for saying that, Ben. Let's all try to remain positive. Let's all try to find our own private Ryan, whoever he or it may be. Mm -hmm. I hope it's an it. I hope it's an it. Hey, was there a porn parody of this? Yeah, but Saving Ryan's private. It's a porn. Nice. Course. Saving him from what? <laughs> Who can say? Ruin. From, from being untouched. <laughs> from, from atrophy. <laughs> yeah, from atrophy. Yeah, underuse. From loneliness. <laughs> yeah. And as always, Tom Sizemore's in it too. Which is <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, he's a paycheck actor. I thought it was Tom Moore size. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> and as always, I only take my shirt off for Vindy's only. Remember when they were trying to make Brian Greenberg a thing? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And thank God they did not. They tried. They tried. He tried to make it in America. <laughs> <laughs> he popped up in something recently, didn't he? I don't know. Yeah, he's been on. Well, I don't know if he, I mean, he was. He was. He did like an arc on Mindy Project, but I don't know if that's. Oh, it was seeing the ads on Hulu, the yeah. relentless ads. Yeah. You're right. That is. Yeah. That's. But God, that that's five years since uh, he was in How to Make It in America. So that's a. Uh... Yeah, he's almost forty. I wonder what he thinks. And he was also famously on that show, unscripted. What was what was it called? Unscripted, unscripted the yeah. HBO thing, yeah. With George Clooney's ex, mm -hmm. and the other one. And uh, he was Krista Miller. Yeah. Was that one? And he yeah. was on October Road. Remember that? Sure. That was with uh, Laura Prepon. I believe. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's the uh, you oh, know, that's big, the worst show of all. It's time. the worst. The big time yeah. Hollywood comes home to like shit yeah. town, Nowheresville. Yeah. And it's based on like the screenwriter of Con Air, right? <laughs> God is. I it? think it is. I think it's what, Rosenberg or whatever his <laughs> name is. God. I think it's based on his life after writing Con Air. Uh, Scott Rosenberg. Ben Foster's marrying Laura Prepon, which is weird. Yeah. Because Con Air in, in Con IRL, Con Air was largely improvised. <laughs> it was. Yeah, it's true. It was yeah. dumb Borat style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Larry Charles is Con Air. Uh, a fun um, fact about Nick Cage: mm -hmm. never on a Harold team. <laughs> <laughs> this is Ben's new bit. <laughs> I like it. It works every time. It's good. Oh boy. Um, yeah. What else have I seen? What else have you seen, Richard? I feel like uh, um, I watched a couple documentaries. Oh yeah, Fire at, Fire at Sea, really, really good. I need to see that. Yeah, um, it's just anytime I want to, I, I just remember that I'd rather do anything else. You know, yeah, than, it's uh, pretty rough. Yeah, exactly. Um, I watched it the day before the election. Great. Uh, and then I am not your Negro, which is really good. The James Baldwin. Right. I really want to see that. Um, and there's a couple others I need to watch, but I've got Patriots Day on Monday. Oh boy. Yeah, and then Silence the next week. Oh, Silence. Mm -hmm. Wait, fuck. Yeah. Oh, that I want to see. Um, I assume that's a I critic circle. I have a plus one. <gasps> Can I go? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. You should invite Oh, that would you be should amazing. Ben. When He's is it? Finest home <laughs> oh, they're right. You're actually sorry. When is it? When sorry. is it? Um, it's during the, it's, it's, it's next Wednesday. It's uh, the 30th of November in the morning. Fantastic. Great. I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> See you there, Ben. Okay, Seriously, cool. buddy. Just, just tell me when and I will be there. That is right. my. Uh, no, I know. That's your. That's my uh, jam. Maybe it'll be shitty. I mean, it's I happened. Mean, should I dress up? <laughs> Yeah, you have to dress like a monk from the 16th century, though. Oh, jeez. So, yeah, All yeah. right. So well, start get my robes out. Yeah. <laughs> start sewing now. This has been a UCB Comedy production. Check out our other shows on the UCB Comedy Podcast Network. 